Where am I going? Donuts and wherever else it pops up. Here we are. Very excited for this one. There's a lot of craziness that I uncovered that even blew my mind while looking this stuff up. And we're going to be focusing today on some North Pole symbolism. I got the North Pole man himself, Mario from Symbolic Studies. And we're going to go ahead and go around the room here. Everybody introduce themselves, plug their stuff, and then we'll we'll get to it. So, Donut, if you want to start off, where can people find you, man? Yo, what up? It's Donut, and you can find me at D-O-E-N-U-T up on Google or YouTube. And Waters Above, you want to plug your stuff, bro? Yeah, my YouTube channel is Waters Above, and then my website is watersabove.com. That's pretty much where you could find out about my work. And thank you for having me on, by the way. Yeah, for sure, dude. Thank you for coming on. Mario. What's up, dude? I'm happy to be here. Uh, you can find me at Symbolic Studies, um, and I'm on YouTube under Symbolic Studies. I am in particularly, in particular, very stoked for this episode. Uh, there's so much mystery and just uh, mind-blowing symbolism connected to the North Pole. Uh, I'm just stoked to see where you guys have been at research-wise and everything. And there's just like no shortage of things to discuss. So let's get to it. And for those that don't know, we haven't shared any information. Some we're going. We did, you know, independent research on our own. Some of us, and we're going to synthesize it right now as we go. And you can find me at the One on One Podcast, any podcast platform, the One on One Podcast on social media. You can find me on there. Talk about it all: the occult, magic, alchemy, all that good stuff. And I'll post everybody's description uh, links in the description below as well. And I want to start off with, I think what got us here, right? Don't I, I had, I was on an episode with you. I brought up the black rock of that John D was talking about with Mercator. And I'm going to share my screen because the UN flag, you could say is from the North pole view. And I also, I want to talk about like the mainstream stuff. Once we get to Santa Claus, a lot of people talk, you know, Joe Rogan, typical stuff. They talk about him potentially being a mushroom in Amanita Muscaria, that the shamans would feed it to the caribou or the elk or whatever it is. And then they would drink the urine of the caribou and they would trip out and they would give it to the caribou. So it's like all this whole thing where the story of Santa Claus, according to some lore, is a psychedelic trip. He was, he is the personification of the Amanita muscaria, the typical white, the red mushroom with the white flakes on it. I think it's in the Smurfs too. I'm not sure if they show it there, but I also heard that the, the hanging of the stockings is symbolic of when you put out the, the mushroom to dry. So when they're hanging it there, it's, it's the, the red stocking, red and white stocking. And then you have the whole thing of Santa Claus maybe being satan or chronos or saturn very weird so i just wanted to show this because obviously the elites use this symbolism for a whole bunch of other things and we're going to get into all this good stuff and then the thing that blew my mind that really when i started looking into it, i was like is this real I, I did not know if this was real or not i thought it was fake but apparently it is the symbolism found on the United States Space Force logos and ranks is mind blowing. So we have obviously here it's pointing to the north. You have Polaris, right? The North Star. And then you have some other constellation. I don't know what these constellations are, Mario, if you want to chime in. But I know they use the Little Dipper and Big Dipper a lot in their symbolism. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure what these are. Um, you know, sometimes the dippers, though, are shown in actually different configurations. Uh, I don't have any slides to show that, but uh, that is a thing where sometimes when you see seven stars and they don't look exactly like the dippers, uh, Ursa Major and Minor, it doesn't mean that that's not what they represent. But yeah, when I saw these logos, I was blown away too, <laughs> for sure. So I thought it was fake. I thought it was somebody doing some meme or something. But this is from the LinkedIn page of the Deputy Director, National Space Intelligence Center. This guy, John Gass. And they were, this is the logo for Space Delta 18. And would you look at that? It's got a Pharaoh's head. 
with again looking up at that Polaris and you have the whole arrow pointing up and for people oh well that's just symbolism no they literally break this symbolism down for you this is directly from the u.s department of defense website defense.gov where they're breaking down the symbolism of what all this means the four beveled elements symbolized with the joint armed forces supporting the space mission air force army navy and marines that sounds like alchemy to me like the four elements uh, the, in the center of the Delta is the star Polaris, which symbolizes how the core values guide the Space Force mission, of course. Inside the Delta, the two spires represent the action of a rocket launching into the outer atmosphere in support of the central role of the Space Force in defending the space domain. Interesting. Because we have the, again, depending on which which area you're in, which group you're in, if you do believe space is real or not, or if you believe that we live on a flat Earth, we're going to go ahead and just anything that you've believed to this point, just throw it out for the for the the time of this episode, however long this goes on for. Just take it out of your head. Take out any any beliefs that you have and just just be in the moment type of thing, because we're going to get crazy. I got some crazy stuff that I'm going to bring up that's really crazy. So here it is. And then the symbol first used in 1961, the Delta symbol honors the heritage of the United States Air Force and Space Command. And so they break this down because I'm pretty sure they're like, hey, people are going to be wondering what they're, you know, these sigils that they're seeing. Literally the people who run the country. So we're going to give them a little bit of a breakdown. I mean, look at this, this vanilla type of <laughs> description. And and that's for the people who probably don't believe that they use symbolism. I mean, we know this. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to look away. It's in your cinema. It's in all your movies. It's everywhere. A corporation is is a, a a person, right? It's a homunculus, a corporation. The the literal definition of corporation is is an artificially created person. And they they tie what to these corporations? They tie sigils, they tie these symbols to them. So to say that it's not there, if you can't see it for yourself, then I don't know what. And if anybody wants to chime in, I'm gonna get yeah, to well, Saint Nicholas. Go ahead. Like you're saying that. Root Bay's 33 mile black rock is really what got me like going crazy on the North Pole stuff and Hyperborea and my friend connecting that to the game Simon and also other games. And I was blown away by this girl, Dana. And I she was showing me this and how there's the volcano in the middle and the four different corners, the four different squares. And this goes all the way back to Atlantis mythology, as if Atlantis was a mythology in the writings that you can read. And then you showed me this, Rupes, how it's a 33-mile black rock, which is pretty nuts. You were showing uh, the image of the UN, the United Nations. Well, that's broken off into 33 fractions, and it's the North Pole as well. So this symbolism of the North Pole, I, I've been just going down a, a huge rabbit hole, and I'm seeing it everywhere now. And it shows up in different symbols. I see it in a key, in a tower. And I'm uh, hopefully to uh, here to learn a lot more about it. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, it is absolutely everywhere. And that is partly what my little presentation is going to get into why that's the case. Uh, Juan, do you mind showing the Pharaoh again, looking up at the pole star? Because one of the ideas the Egyptians had was that you go to the north upon death. And they showed, uh, I'm, I was reading a book called the Isis Thesis. And the woman was talking about the idea that they believe that you exited uh, the horn of a great bull upon death, which is basically the opening of our electromagnetic spectrum on Earth at the north, which is why we have the northern lights. And so there's this idea that we go to the north upon death and that we actually come from the north as well. And so the North Star is this idea that um, very much is related to um, you know, the afterlife process. So that's the first thing I think about when I see that image. That's interesting because the Northern lights smell like sulfur. So I heard the ancients <laughs> believed that they were ghosts. 
Whoa. Brilliant, brilliant. I've never heard of that before, the sulfur thing. That's fascinating. Yeah, neither have I. Well, it, the, area, the areas where you could see the northern lights just have more geothermal activity. So that's why you're getting that sulfuric kind of, kind of odor. But mm. um, one thing that's really interesting about this is kind of the theory that of the black sun of Sola Negra and like this mm -hmm. emitting of this black sun almost as if it's a Tesla coil. And when it's pushing through this northern polar opening, having this effect on the electromagnetic you know spectrum and we have the electronosphere and magnetosphere and there's clearly some something going on there for anyone who's seen the northern lights i have a bunch of times because i've traveled to iceland quite a bit um but even the southern lights are quite an interesting phenomenon but when you start to connect that black sun concept to all of this and the symbology that you get with freemasonry and i mean it really starts to become quite fascinating but one of the things that I wanted to bring up when you guys talking about this 33 foot uh, black cube, uh, remember the movie Space Odyssey uh, 2001, where one of the introduction scenes, it just shows you like these primitive peoples and uh, out of nowhere lands like they just kind of randomly see this black slab. That's, you know, this this black uh, pillar, if you will, doesn't quite it's not an obelisk or anything of that sort, but it, it literally does just look like a, a random black slab perfectly placed. And uh, one of the scenes is a quick transition to you seeing a crescent moon and also the sun simultaneously. So it's getting a lot into the astro astrology, maybe kind of pointing at some of these clues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think um, one of the things that this central uh, area between or what we're looking at right now could be Mount Meru. Like some people could has have called called it that too. It's really interesting. I haven't actually heard of Rupees Nigra. Um so I have to look into that more because in my work I get into finances quite a bit. And of course we have to talk about Black Rock if we talk about finances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, this central um point in the north where these four rivers emanate from, um, you know, it's been compared to a mountain, Mount Maru, as you were saying, also a world tree. Uh, I believe it's also a metaphor for the Holy Grail, for the Philosopher's Stone. Mm. I think there's a lot of relics that people have looked for over time, but it's actually symbolic of what's going on at the north. And so, again, that's some of the stuff I'll be getting to in my little presentation here. But yeah, you're spot on. And I want to add some context to this this Black Rock, right? One of the one of the most powerful corporations in the world is Black Rock, but the Rupus Nigra it was a phantom island. Was believed to be thirty three mile wide Black Rock, where Cater actually describes the rock circumference as thirty three French miles located at the magnetic North Pole or at the North Pole itself. Now it comes from a work titled. Inventio for Fortunata, uh, and I pulled it up here, and it was it's a lost book of some sort. So you have here it is a lost book, probably dating from the 14th century, containing a description of the North Pole as a magnetic island surrounded by a giant whirlpool and four continents. No direct extracts from the document have been discovered, but its influence on Western idea of the geography of the Arctic region persisted for several centuries. Now, is very there was a a letter that Mercator wrote to English astronomer John D. The John D. The what some people say is the OG 007. He was the court astrologer, the Queen Elizabeth, and he was also talking to interdimensional beings uh, for, for quite a long time. And the letter that Mercator wrote to D, I found it super fascinating. So he says, in the midst of the four countries is a whirlpool into which there empty these four indrawing seas, which divide the north and the water rushes round and descends into the earth, just as if one were pouring it through a filter funnel it is four degrees wide on every side of the pole that is to say eight degrees altogether except that right under the pole there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea its circumference is almost 33 french miles and it is all of magnetic stone magnetic stone and is as high as the clouds so the priest said now check this out who had received an astrolabe from the Minorite in exchange for a testament. 
And the Menorite himself had heard that one can see all around it from the sea, and that it is black and glistening, and nothing grows thereon, for there is not so much as a handful of soil onto it. So they have almost like a, a, a priest that was talking about it as high as the cloud, or maybe it's going off based off somebody's description of it. And the more interesting part is here, modern researchers are the people that the Ferrar encountered. So they uh, allegedly encountered pygmies at, the, at this location. So small little people. And I know me and Donna have been going down the rabbit hole of the homunculus. So as soon as I saw pygmies or small people, it just boom, just clicked right in my head. So it's almost like this mythological thing, but it's pouring into the world. Now, as of recently, right, we were talking about the North Pole. You can't really go there. It's just a point. They, so they say Santa Claus comes from the North Pole. You have all these different things. Well, it made me think of immediately of the concave earth theory. And of course, here in Florida, the, the Khorashans, they believe that we were living on the inside of the world and that what we're seeing is actually in the center. So the galaxy is in the center and that's what's rotating and we're actually living on the inside part. So it's concave earth. Now, <laughs> the thing is, this isn't out of the realm because I don't know if you guys have heard of Admiral Byrd at all. Right. I was just about sure. to. I was just about to ask about uh, if you were aware if Admiral Byrd spoke on this central island because I haven't dived too deep into his work, and I'm sure a lot of it has been manipulated when it was given back to the public. But mm -hmm. I wonder if he's spoken about the central island. He didn't speak about the central island, but for those, a quick recap: Admiral Byrd was a very highly decorated. Uh, I don't know if it's sergeant or whoever he was. He was in, he was in the, let's say the Navy. I could be getting that wrong, but he was, anyways, he was in the armed forces and he was very highly dedicated, uh, decorated. He was a very serious guy and he is known for operation high jump, which was the infamous Nazis at the hollow earth in Antarctica. That's he supposedly fought UFO craft in Antarctica. It was in 1947, this crazy secret space, a secret uh, army mission and they found the, in the South pole, but he was also known for being the first person to go to the North pole. Now this was pub. There was a story published after he had died stating that he had, when he was flying to the North pole, he had encountered an opening. And when he went in there, there was a whole civilization inside of, it was called the Gartha. Now this was, uh, it was, what do they call it? Posthumously? Is that how you say it? Am I getting that right? When it's, when it's published after he died posthumously, hopefully I'm saying that right. But you can find this in the, there's a book called the secret Admiral Byrd's secret journey beyond the poles, a secret diary. And he talks about him going in and, and meeting these beings inside and supposedly Byrd's wife read his log books for the final side of the Admiral contacted the representatives of the underground civilization who overtook us for 1000 years of development. So he was talking about some ancient race, again, Atlantis sort of thing. And this is coming from allegedly the journal, the lost diary of Admiral Byrd. So you can take that for what it is because it was post, it was published after he had died, but the guy allegedly wasn't full of crap at all. The guy was a straight shooter, you know, no stories and, he allegedly wrote this where he went into the, the, the hollow earth from the North pole. And it's very funny that we can never go to the South pole to Antarctica or to the North pole, right? They always talk about that. It's shifting around. Well, is it really, or is there some sort of, dare I say some opening and maybe, Hey, this is just me. And I know I'm going to get some, some slack for it. I'm not a flat earther, but maybe what if they're pushing flat earth to distract people from what's going on at the North pole? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm just putting that out there. Don't shoot well, the messenger. So I think it's really um I think it's really fascinating how in that picture that you showed it said a saucer to Venus. And if you go back to that other picture that you shared of the earth kind of like split open with like a, the concave earth theory as you were speaking on earlier, well in the mythologies of Venus or Aphrodite, she's delivered from the waters Oof. and she's delivered in the clam shell and she's the pearl of the clam, right? She's the pearl. 
And uh, that's always kind of been a big symbolism behind the divine feminine. But furthermore, this what we're what we're looking at right now is pretty incredible to think of um, being this like pearl within or the the central sun, or is it the sun that we see that we call the sun? Or you know, we talked a little bit about the black sun earlier. But everything comes in threes. You know, like even in alchemy, when you're drawing alchemical symbols, you can only do three strokes of the pen. So I would not be surprised if there was the sun that we look at called Helios, and then we have that central sun, which could be Venus or Lucifer, the morning star, and then we have that sun below, the Tesla coil, the black sun. And that'd be a fascinating theory to expound upon, especially with people that aren't too caught up in the flat earth thing, because I'm more on your side where I'm open-minded past Mm -hmm. the idea that Perhaps there's a distra- there's a psyop within a psyop within a psyop, and <laughs> when Netflix starts making documentaries, then you could kind of confirm the psyop. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Also, that Agartha has the Shambhala in it. It's a Shambhala, which is also the same name. And this goes into the Theosophical Society's Helen Blavatsky, which Hitler fell asleep with that book right there on the left with this book and even our U S presidents, our 33rd vice president was a big theosophist. And he's the guy who put the pyramid on the back of the silver certificate on the U S dollar. If I could just show my screen real quick on three slides before you guys get into it, because I think it's uh, pretty funny finds that I found that uh, get us in, get us into it real, real quick. Um, so I just heard about, we did a troll documentary about trolls, me and Juan. And today my cousin, she's from Belize. And she was telling me, she was like, no, trolls are real. I'm from Belize. There's this thing <laughs> called a Tata Duende. And I was all like, Tata Duende, I, that's dope. I never, I, so I just want to throw that on there. Tata Duende, something to research. But on the back of the dollar bill, you got Agartha right there. You could see it on the the sides. It's the same symbol as the hollow earth on the back of the dollar bill as well. And as waters brought up right in the beginning of that, this, you think this is 2001 space odyssey. This is the new Barbie movie coming out. Whoa, and they're wow. showing that. it is almost identical to the same scene from they space were mi- they were mimicking yeah, it yeah they were they were mimicking the scene that's why but that's why it's so identical but i thought that was important to show because this is super connected to that whole north pole stuff and that dollar research. that you had that high quality image of the dollar that that's a good thing to talk on later um especially when i guess you guys start getting into santa claus and perhaps saturnalia and some of the things tied to this particular time of year but you know that eagle is a symbol of jupiter so this is a also important when you get into the mythologies because whether you want to tie in saturn as santa and that's not my words that's probably what a lot of people yeah. kind of quickly come to with etymology but you know then you always have to talk about jupiter you always have to talk about jupiter if you're going to talk about saturn and the oak tree and i mean even the amount of arrows that are being held here like this is a pretty amazing symbol the, it's all chemical too out the north correct yeah and uh the fact that uh donut went further with showing like the maybe this is them giving us a little bit of the map of the hollow hollow earth or you know all of this circle symbolism that we get we could kind of look at it as such you know it could be a black hole it could be a sun it could be a portal it could be um but yeah when it comes to the actual alchemy and the symbols and drawing and circles capture energy right so like once you circle it the energy is stored within that circle now and that comes back to sigil magic and it's just so amazing to start looking at this and to talk with about symbols with with people and agreed there's a lot to decode here for sure um the main thing to me you know about the north pole and and uh potential trips to the north pole which by the way there's a school of thought that a lot of the north pole trips are frauds and hoaxes yes and that they have never actually went you know because it may not be um a place that you can actually visit uh for various different reasons depending on how you roll but the main thing you hear about is this gateway to another place this portal you know which fits in line with kind of the afterlife stuff um that i'm was talking about earlier you know the egyptians thinking that you go to the north there's a lot of other groups that believe that your soul literally goes northward or eastward and then northward uh towards the north pole 
And so um, I'm of the opinion that the northern sky in connection with the North Pole and all of that is uh, a preeminent gateway um, that you can actually access, that people have been accessing for a very, very long time. And potentially it could be how we descend here and actually ascend out of here too. So there's a lot of ascension material that suggests that you want to work with the northern sky, the circumpolar constellations uh, to get out of here astrally. Mar Mario, have you ever watched that Kanye West video for the song 24? No, I don't think it's so. It's just from a symbology perspective. Like you don't need to actually listen to the music, but I do recommend you watch it because okay. it shows you he's kind of like being lifted up. He's being kind of like, you know, levitating and then his body gets to the clouds and then he's really, you know, the speeding up. And then he gets all the way up to the point where it becomes like simulated mm. and he leaves, he leaves out of it from a big sphere, uh, mm -hmm. which I guess is it could, it's probably Uranus father sky. It's probably the final toroidal field. So he's, it's, it's really interesting. Like, but what you just spoke on it, you'd be educated enough to the point where I think if you watched it, you'd be like, holy shit, you know, these elites, right. whatever you want to call them, apex predators, like they're giving you a lot of symbolism in their art. And I feel like that music video in particular did an amazing job at exposing um, that. I I've uh, decoded a bunch of his listening parties that he's done because it has so much symbolism of the coming age and a lot of the, it's all predictive programming, right? But that music video in particular really resonated with what you just said. Excellent. I'm into it. Yeah, I see it all over the place. Even um, that Pixar movie, uh, Soul, you know, they're going to this big bright spot in the sky. There's a stairway going right towards it and stuff. I'm of the opinion that the actual stairway to heaven is a literal thing and it exists at the north. And so there's a lot of Freemasonic tracing boards where they show an actual ladder going towards a star that is not the sun and it's not the moon. Um, it's a seven pointed star oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And that's symbolic of the North Star and the circumpolar constellations that revolve around it, Ursa Major and Minor, which each have uh, seven stars to them. So that's kind of my opinion uh, about that. But yeah, the, great stuff so far, guys. The I'm Kanye this thing is super connected with this whole North stuff. His daughter's name North. He went oh, to Polaris really? High School. What? <laughs> For no real? way. I didn't know about any of that. Yeah, he was on Nori's show. Nori means North. So it goes deep with the North stuff and Kanye. He's known as the bear. Polaris is his, the little bear constellation. Whoa. And wow. Yeah, you brought, up, that you brought up so many, so many great things. I mean, his logo for a long time, like kind of the aesthetic logo that he was choosing to use was like a blue sphere. And I think that was on purpose. Like he, he was using a lot of this, uh, well, you know, exoterically, he's leveraging on Jesus and and Christianity and talking that way. But we know what he's really talking about. It's it's like he's giving you one thing, but it's inverted into the and amazing connection with the bear. Wow! Well, his, I didn't even his think new, of that. His new logo is Polaris. It is the eight pointed wow. Polaris star. Okay, just real quick. Uh, when I started getting into this information. I was fortunate enough to have a friend be a really serious uh, mythologist and symbologist, was into it for decades before I really got into it. And I started sharing all of this Northern symbolism stuff. And he just put it really succinctly for me. And he said, the deal is that the supreme deity of most cultures comes from the North. Even if the common people aren't aware of that, that is the hidden veiled symbolism. And so um, to me, the throne of God exists in the northern sky. So there's a lot of goddess worship and God symbolism that's associated with the northern sky. So the fact that they would associate him with the north, you know, it's definitely encoding all of that symbolism, in my opinion. This is all yeah, space story Force of... stuff, too, by the way. They have the you have the literally the bear with the key. So and it's and then they connect it and they put us an arrow pointing to the Polaris. So Again, this whole thing of I love anything portal talk, interdimensional, that just makes my nipples hard. And to think that I think maybe some of this occulted knowledge is that knowledge of that ascension, the soul ascent. And it's waters above is a heavy hitter, don't he? He didn't tell me it was a heavy hitter, but he's coming in hot. And he's Bro, come on, man. You know me. You know me. You know talking about me. some you know black belt, some black belt stuff and the soul ascent. I have a book by a visionary artist, friend of mine, and 
the platonic solids play a role into this too, where you are able to uh, either a Merkaba, right? A Merkaba or some sort of soul mm -hmm. transportation vehicle. It takes the form of a platonic solid. And uh, depending on the celestial sphere, it's a core, you know, Saturn is a cube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think that's also a part that plays into, because you said, you know, sigil magic. It's a mandala essentially for your consciousness. And when they put all these things in front of you, they're trying to either charge it. They're trying to steal. When you're in, watching a movie, you're in a trance. When you're watching TV, you're in a trance. When you're listening to music, you're in a trance. Mix all that together. You got the perfect alchemical, magical ritual in some sort of way. And they do it in front of thousands of people at these concerts. You have the whole, what was the recent one? The travel, the guy that a bunch of people died. And he had the, the Astro World. What's his name? I'm drawing a blank. Travis Scott. Travis Scott. That whole thing. Like if that wasn't a ritual, then I don't know what was. And there was well, it, well, exactly. Juan, if you go back to that last picture that you just had up where it was the Big Dipper or the... I believe it was that pointing to the, yeah. So that's important to talk about because we were talking a little bit earlier about, um, I believe you were talking about Hitler. Uh, you could talk about NASA. This again is all quite important stuff. But one thing that needs to be spoken of, I think pretty early talking about the cosmos, talking about the stars, is that the Big Dipper as we rotate through the solstices, the spring, winter, fall, and summer, around polaris is what creates that symbol we call the swastika and that is exactly why they use that logo uh why the national socialist party used that logo and you look at operation paperclip with warner von braun and pretty much leading the apollo missions the quote-unquote moon landing you know this is all really important to consider and this isn't a thing of the nazis this is a symbol that goes back to the ancient you know sumerian times pretty much Bro, right. you know exactly. Michael Aquino? You know who Michael yeah, Aquino I do. is? Sure. He uh, was in, no, he, I don't. He was in charge of psychological operations. He started a satanic temple. He worked for the military. It was called the Temple of Set. That was in Presidio, California, where they put Star oh, Wars. Is this the guy like, with the weird eye, eyebrows? Weird yes. eyebrows. Yeah. It looks like an owl. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. If you look at his coat of arms, he made his family crest. It has the uh, little dipper in it as well. I could pull it up. Or you oh, is that up. right? Yeah, so That's that very little interesting, dude. dipper does pop up a lot. Well, like 100%. I thought it was really funny. Somebody sent me a video of uh, Charles Manson when he was in jail, and he put a swat. He put that symbol between his eyes, right? And it's really funny because you know the eyes on the the eyes on the sides lie, and the pineal body is the first eye. And putting that symbol right there and us talking about the rotation of the Big Dipper around the solstices, it's like it seems like a joke and maybe he is kind of borderline schizophrenic, but, you know, it, it's kind of it's an important tattoo. <laughs> like it's actually a tattoo that has a lot of power. It has a lot of symbolism behind it. And um, you, we know why people put the Bindi uh, there, for instance, but that particular symbol is a very powerful symbol. So, of course, in this modern age, they've demonized it. Of course, they want us to look down on it. They want it to be. And that's what they do with everything. Right. They always want to demonize powerful things because it demotes its power. Then we're afraid of it. And then once you have fear, it kind of controls you. That's right. Uh, I, I think one thing. Go ahead, dude. Oh, no, I just brought that. If you want to see that slide, I, I have it there real quick. That's uh, Quino's family crest right there. But you can see the b little dipper right there, whatever it's called, Big Dipper, in the blue. Oh, nice. Amazing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that one of the fascinating things that I've come across over the last few years is that there are multiple black magical occult groups that revere and work with the northern sky and so they consider the ecliptic and astrology um the solar based system of things of divination and everything i don't think that uh, a lot of these groups are really into that they're actually uh working with the north star ursa major and minor and there's this overlap with lovecraftian black magic and what's going on in the northern sky as well i did an episode with juan about it a while back it's really really fascinating so there are groups that have a uh, clear understanding of what's going on over there which i think is really really fascinating check this out this is another space force 
logo where it's got like this entity right wow. at the north with this thing and then we're talking about lovecraft you know the cosmicism with the space and the cosmic horror and then you have again very just in, in interesting symbolism is all i'm wow. saying it's not it, you know you can take your for what can it you is go but, back to this which one please the the first one with the this with the grim reaper yeah, yeah. so that's saturn mm -hmm. saturn spins the zodiac wheel Wow, this is the greatest picture I've seen in a long time. Like as a decoder, I'm like, whoa. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. About that 23 in there, the 23 20... is where we get the crossbones and skull and bones. Because it's That's at right. a 23 yeah. degree. And uh, the skull is Saturn, Kronos, in the Sicilian skull and bones uh, pirates logo. And that crossbone is also that uh four square cross the sun cross as well i believe you know it's amazing. interesting a lot of people bring up saturn being the old sun um i think there's reason to believe that saturn may have once been the pole star as well mm, uh, yes the, the star in the northern sky so i think that's intriguing too correct can you talk a little bit about that mario what 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 evidence you have supporting that uh, most of the information I got about that uh, came from the Electric Universe side of things, mm -hmm. and um, they show this alignment, and to me, what it looks like, it looks like polar symbolism, it looks like Axis Mooney symbolism, and whenever I've heard stories about Saturn being the previous sun, I think that's fascinating, given everything Saturn represents, um, but when I was looking at that information recently with Gabe, actually, a friend of the show, um, I just started thinking about it. I'm like, you know what? I think actually what's being encoded here is that Saturn used to be the pole star. And so the pole star shifts uh, with precession. And so that could make sense that a long, long time ago, Saturn may have been one of the first emanations from this sacred center. And then it just got pushed further and further and further out. Um, you know, so it's at the very end of the traditional seven planetary system. So it's known for being slow and lumbering and things like that. And so um, just thought I would throw that out there. And the, but uh, Waters Above, you, you agree with that? Is that who said that or was that Donut? Yeah, because, well, I think of it through the mythological story. Like if you think we've moved out of the Saturn, the Saturn rule, and if you think of the difference between law of the land and so what we have now, admiralty law, maritime commerce law, now it's all about Jupiter and Mercury. So like Jupiter is the king of the gods, but that's the god of our age. And that is for them. And when I say them, I'm talking about people that are born in castles for no reason. And when I say us, I'm talking about the, the people, the people that need documentation and paperwork to have privilege to do things on this earth. So that's Mercury we have to deal with regarding that. And that right there would make so much sense because the mythological story talks about Jupiter or Zeus overthrowing his father, Saturn. So there was at a time where we had that influence of Saturn, and that was when humans were in the golden age. That was when us, the regular people, actually had sovereignty. Uh, we weren't keeping paperwork that provided privilege to do things. That came later with a fiat money system and with admiralty law and all the things that we're dealing with today. And it's quite interesting how they push a lot of negative onto Saturn. It could be through the work of Jordan Maxwell, and by I'm by no means uh, saying anything against his his great work. I honor the man, but uh, I think the delivery of a lot of his messages started to demean that, and that was done on purpose because he was a Mason as well. So we're in the age of Jupiter, and um, just thinking about that change, like you said, with the procession of the equinox and how it all works, where we're the stationary realm and everything else is moving, like it's like a gyroscope. It's quite interesting, but I've heard many many people who study this uh, speak on this idea that saturn was the the prior sun and i i think we have yet to talk about sirius uh thus mm. far so where do you guys stand on that because i mean i think that's a huge piece of this i'm ignorant to anything serious i'll be 100 percent honest but i don't well, know if mario has Sir anything. serious is the dog star and this is what Every single thing during the helical rising, America is founded upon. If you look up the ancient Egyptian logo of Sirius, it's the phallic, which is the Washington Monument, the five-pointed star, which is on our flag, and the dome on the hieroglyphs of Sirius. But before we get to that, I uh, just wanted to notate that on that Space Force logo, 
with Polaris and the Ethereum looking thing pointing up. <laughs> I noticed, I could be wrong, but I noticed like, I was trying to count it. It looked like there was 22 stars and that 22 stars is all over the Cinemagicians with Paramount Pictures. There's 22 stars. Mm. It shows up all over the place. I believe even the Mithra Statue of Liberty has 22 stars. This one? Uh, no, not that one, but that does look like a phallic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they're all, I mean, it, dude, I don't, I, that's why. It's, I, the, it's, it's the main cool. logo for the Space Force. Uh, it was the first one you showed. Uh, this one? <laughs> yeah. I was counting the stars. I looked like there's 22 little ones. Mm. And again, I, I just flipped through all of them uh, on the Wikipedia page here. And dude, I mean, some, some of the stuff is like so occult looking. I mean, I really don't know what to even Bro. think about. <laughs> also, the space force. Yeah, you could show. see the amount of uh, eagle symbolism that they're showing you. That's super sure. important. And the, I, guarantee, I guarantee you whenever they're going against that, it's probably because of something to do with the month or the zodiac that we're in during that time. Because mm. I'm seeing different animals, but you could see the Capricorn and you could see the... Yeah, it's Look at this. This is a dog? Wow. What is this? Like, it's crazy. A dragon? Right. A dragon? interesting yes yeah. and the next one is the scales libra wow the next one that's the heaven of heavens that's new mm -hmm. the firmament that's actually wild. um i think that there's a correspondence with a lot of the uh astrological signs uh and the northern sky so i even saw information that basically related the scales of libra to the two uh dippers that they can be interpreted mm. as, as scales and that in ancient China, the dippers uh, were once referred to as the jade scales. And when you're weighing mm. this jade, uh, one of the scales is bigger than the other, the, the counterweight and then the actual scale itself. So, um, you know, dipper symbolism is really, really deep, which is crazy it's to lit. me because it's like one of the constellations that like kids can see and you notice <laughs> when you're just a youngin, you know, to think that there's all what this you just brought up stuff is wild go for it what you just brought up about the scales is so uh, amazing because somebody was asking me recently like why is lady justice's scales tipped like not in balance and mm. she's also blindfolded okay and it's mm -hmm. because we don't have uh we don't have victim ju justice we have criminal justice mm. Damn, like if fire. you study the dirt <laughs> <laughs> like if you study the difference between the you know how how the system works, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's rigged. It's sure. so rigged. But then you see that symbolism where Lady Justice is blindfolded holding the scales that are unbalanced outside of the court buildings. And it makes so much sense because we have criminal justice and the, you know, the attorneys or the lawyers or whatever, they're in, they're in the pockets of the judges and it's all just kind of tilt. The scales are tilted in their favor against you. It's to get you in jail. It's to get you to pay a fee. It's to get you to be part of that, you know, mercurial uh, fake money scam system through law. Wow. That's going to be the clip for like my intro, dude. That was that was fire. I never even <laughs> thought about that, that that word mixing in there. And yeah, I don't know where you guys want to go with it. I know we're going to be talking about I, I want to touch on Santa Claus, right? We're talking about Saturn a little bit. Maybe we can get into Santa Claus and move him out of the way because I found some stuff that blew my mind. I don't know if it's going to blow you guys' mind, but it blew my mind. And I don't know if you guys want to talk about that and then get in. Gabe, the, uh, I'm sorry, not Gabe. Uh, Mario, did you have anything you wanted me to pull up from your presentation at all? At the moment, you know, uh, no. But if it's cool, I would love to cruise through it unless you think it's going to be too much. No, no, yeah, I we got an expedited. No, no, take your time it. with it. I'll pull it up now. Cool, cool. And then have we'll... you seen the Space Force show with Michael I haven't. Scott? Yeah, they sing Aruba, Aruba, uh, that song, Jamaica, Aruba, <laughs> na, na, Benny, na. but bro, like Aruba, this has nothing to do with the North, but there's giants. It's the Abraham Lincoln wrote letters about how there's giants at Aruba. And I just think that's interesting because in the show, The Office, they sing the Aruba Aruba song as well. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Usually I always try and find any everything occult related to anything that I watch. And I have hard times with shows like The Office and Breaking Bad. But then there's always something, some nugget of something that will appear some on some episode I'm doing. I go, oh, 
that's what that show's all about. That's what they're putting out there. That's what they're talking about. And you've talked about in the office where they talk about some weird stuff, you know, related to the homunculus. And even this Aruba thing was like, what are you, why on two separate shows with the same actors type of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I love the office, bro. It's full of wild, wild stuff. Where do you like watch it a million times? Like I've watched it. <laughs> Mario, do you want me to pull this up? And yeah. Yeah. If you want to get this going, we can do that for sure. Um, we'll end up at Santa Claus towards the end. Awesome. So just a heads up about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess just to say it, man, you, I mean, Juan knows this, but I love this shit. So when he said that he wanted to talk about the North Pole, I'm like, <laughs> I'm in. I started making slides. I probably made a little too many, but uh, we'll, we'll cruise through it. There's good information in here. Um, so a little quote from a book that I'm actually reading right now called The Celestial Ship of the North. Uh, regarding the North, uh, this is the Garden of Eden, the North Pole itself, the North that was called Sacred the home of the constellation of the great bear, the genitrix, which I believe just means uh, parents, whose seven stars were the sailors who watched over and ever will watch over the celestial sea. So just getting into this idea that the North Pole is related to the Garden of Eden and also this concept of like the fountain of youth as well. Um, and obviously they're acknowledging the seven stars of Ursa Major and Minor, that's a really, really big deal. And so I felt like this was a good one just to kind of start off with, with kind of where I'm going at with everything. Uh, but then if we proceed here, the recurrence of certain themes, the North, the pole star, the number seven, the axis mundi, which is just that central pole, ascent and descent to and from the North is certainly suggestive of a baseline idea concerning the relationship between humanity and divinity and this comes from a book called stairway to heaven by peter lavenda and he gets into a lot of this symbolism relating the north to this actual gateway or portal or stairway to the other side and so if we go to the next slide here where i'm coming at with everything is that i think at the very least we have to acknowledge geocentrism as a symbolic foundation so there's a lot of things that we talk about now in the modern world that have come from that geocentric sort of framework of looking at everything through that lens. So on the left-hand side, we have things that relate to geocentrism and heliocentrism. So Donut, you know, one of the reasons why you're seeing Northern symbolism everywhere is because the symbolic framework that we have now was built upon that, arguably, I would say. So on the left, we have geocentrism. On the right, we have heliocentrism. Geocentrism is earth-based versus heliocentrism uh, being sun-based. Geocentrism is a polar-based system, meaning um, you look at the night sky and all of the stars revolve around the North Star. This is a polar-based system. Everything's re revolving around that central pole. Obviously, with heliocentrism, we have a solar-based system where everything is revolving around the sun. In geocentrism, the pole star and the northern sky means way, way more than in a heliocentric mindset or framework. So it's all about the pole star versus in heliocentrism, it's all about the local star, which means that in geocentrism, it was all about the northern sky and the circumpolar constellations that don't dip below the horizon line like the ecliptic, like astrology. So a lot of people um, kind of, they just, um, they look at astrology and they start studying the zodiac but they don't understand that this is a solar-based system. That's what the ecliptic is. It's the path of the sun. But there was another system before that. So there were other sky clocks before the ecliptic, before astrology. And I would argue that one of the most ancient primitive sky clocks was actually the northern sky and following Ursa Major going around Polaris. And so uh, the geocentric framework has a big emphasis on the number seven, and so these are like the seven creative forces uh, that emanated from the northern sky. Um, there's a correlation with that and the seven traditional planets. Um, a lot of times there are groups that believe that seven sages came from the northern sky. If you look into uh, Vedic mythology, that's something you'll see. Those are, uh, they're called the Rishis. And I just read this in a book that had... Uh, the seven stars of Ursa Major were also once referred to as reindeer with indigenous native peoples. And so to me, that's a really fascinating connection, given the fact that Santa is obviously from the North Pole and everything else. Um, 
And you guys feel free and chime in at any point with all of this stuff. And so the number 12 is definitely a solar number, in my opinion. That's why there's 12 signs, 12 apostles, uh, 12 months of the year, a lot of different things like that related to the number 12 being a uh, solar based uh, number. And so if we cruise down to the next symbol or to the next page, you'll see the symbol. This is the quartered circle. So if you ask a lot of people now about this symbol, they're going to say it's a sun based symbol. But according to my research, this is actually a geocentric earth based symbol. It's referencing uh, the North Pole, which is right in the middle. Uh, it's where X marks the spot, right? Um, and then it's a reference to the four corners of Earth, the four winds, these four rivers that emanate from the central location. And so I think what has happened is that there were a lot of symbols that were geocentric and northern based, um, Earth based. And they basically transitioned into being solar based symbols. This is kind of my whole entire research field right now is just understanding this transition a little bit more. And so I think a very similar thing happened actually with the next symbol, which is called the circumpunct. Sometimes it's called the Godhead and it's a circle with a dot right in the middle. And so I think that this symbol is actually kind of expressing the same thing. It's a geocentric earth-based symbol it's representing the axis Mooney right in the middle with the dot. And then I think at a certain point it was transitioned into a solar based symbol. So now it's known as the symbol uh, for the sun. And, and so I can't tell if I'm lagging on my end, but uh, I still see the quartered cross. Okay. Yeah. Now I see all you guys. And uh, cause I'll, the quartered cross, I know donut had some stuff on that, right? Cause X marks the nice. spot. And it's right. also, it looks like the, the Mercator, interpretation of the black rock at the north pole if you look at it from the bigger perspective it looks like that cross that that you know the x marks exactly. the spot type of thing yep so very interesting yeah the four corners this is all i've been looking at all month is learning about this sun cross but it's the polaris as I got a couple slides I can show later, but one-on-one uh, -on -one showed me how that's for Polaris. And I mean, the Hopi nation as well mm -hmm. has that as the symbol. It's uh, so fascinating. So I'm, I'm really digging what you're talking about. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it is uh, it's also stuff. the mutable cross. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, Definitely. I think it that's could like represent... a huge thing when you talk about um, Freemasonry, like the three phases where you go mm. from like fixed to Cardinal, the Grand Master, Cardinal Cross. And if we're talking about uh, Christmas symbology, you know, that Cardinal Cross is great for that because it looks like the Christmas tree with the with the star on top. Mm. I see. Yeah, I think it could represent a number of crosses, too, obviously. Um but it's just intriguing to me that there was this general switch that happened. So that is definitely my jam right now. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, you guys are familiar with this. It looks like already, but uh, Ursa Minor, the tip of the handle of Ursa Minor, that star is the North Star, also known as Polaris. Um, and Ursa Major and Minor, it's the Great Bear and Little Bear. So we're actually talking about because they're circumpolar, we're talking about polar bears. And so these are stars, these are constellations close to the center spot of the northern sky where all the stars revolve around. And so it's, to me, just fascinating that we call um, polar bears polar bears, but I don't think we call any other northern animal, animal polar anything. <laughs> and so I think that's kind of strategic. And then obviously in advertising and everything else, we associate Santa with polar bears as well. And Coca-Cola so, too, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. For sure. You know, but uh, these constellations, though, they've been called many things. And so uh, they've been referred to as plows or wagons, um, obviously bears, like I was saying, uh, dippers. And so um, there's a lot of different correspondences for these two constellations and they both have seven stars apiece and this whole system has kind of been compared to like a great wheel or a mill in the sky so there's a book about all of this called hamlet's mill i think it came out in the 40s 
Um, but wheel symbolism is definitely appropriate right now when we're talking about the northern sky and everything that it represents. Chariots as well. It's been compared to chariots for sure. Yeah, we recently did that episode straight on the chariot card, so I think it's relevant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the exactly. wheel is like the sun wheel, and that wheel has the eight pointed stars in a lot of it. The Tesla logo mm-hmm. is eight different sections just like polaris and that's the will these symbols be popping up everywhere um why does polaris this is a question i had for waters and he answered it really nicely uh but i'd like to hear from you mario why does if you know polaris has the eight stars right but so does ishtar and ishtar is venus and ishtar's also got eight stars do you know Mm -hmm. why um the two symbols are the same. Well, um, it's interesting because obviously each constellation here has seven stars, right? Um, And so there's seven stars a piece. So I associate it very closely to the number seven, but the number eight and uh, eight pointed star is so much easier to draw than a seven pointed star or a nine pointed (laughs) star. And so I've been a designer for, you know, going on two decades now and so I just, whenever I see stars, I can almost tell you immediately how many points a star has just by a quick glance or whatever. Yeah. And so the eight-pointed star, all you have to do, right, is draw one line, another horizontal line, and then a line that divides each of those quadrants. And so it's eight-pointed. Um, there is a fascinating thread right now that I'm looking into regarding uh, Venus symbolism and Venus worship and its true role in this whole entire system. And so there is a very, very strong Venusian um, thread that exists at the northern sky. So as an example, like the Virgin Mary, you know, um, she's sometimes called Stella Maris. So this is a reference to the North Star. She's considered the guiding star for Christ. And so a lot of the northern symbolism, at least with the church, has kind of been reappropriated and um, been channeled towards the Virgin Mary. And so... um, As far as Venus, though, having the eight pointed star and then Polaris sometimes having the eight pointed star, um, you know, I can't say I have like a really good beat on exactly why Venus would be eight. Well, actually, I do know, I believe it's over the course of eight years, Venus, from the perspective of Earth, Venus makes a perfect five pointed star. And so uh, whenever you see a five pointed star anywhere, I I strongly relate it to Venus, which is... uh, you know, the fifth card in the major arcana is the Hierophant, which is ruled by Taurus, which is ruled by Venus. So if people want to see that, it's called uh, the Venus Rose or the Venus Pentacle. Uh, sometimes it's called the Kiss of Venus. And there's a correspondence with this eight-year cycle making that five-pointed star. Um, but I would love to hear what Waters Above has to say about the eight-pointed star, because I, I find that topic really intriguing. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually trying to remember what I told you, Donut, like in what context we were talking about. Because when we were talking about Polaris, I think it was in regards to the, the star on top of the Christmas tree. That's what I remember us discussing. So do you, can you just fill me in on what we were discussing? Yeah, so like the Bethlehem star is Polaris mm-hmm. and Ishtar is for Venus. And Venus is the same star. And uh, we were talking and I was like, why do they have the same two different uh you know symbols and i i'm I'm not good at explaining what you said but it made sense (laughs) yeah i mean well the symbolism the symbolism that we're getting is like clear phallic symbolism with an ejaculation on top and that's just that's what all of this stuff actually comes back to like if you look at the vatican uh keyhole like when you look at the vatican from a bird's eye view or saint peter's cathedral you look at that area it's just a keyhole a keyhole is the vatica which is the vagina which is the feminine portal and you have the phallus which is osiris's phallus yeah, the and peter just have the, the call it yeah, peter exactly. you know, like a we have the, <laughs> exactly exactly and we were talking about how um a lot of these trophies that you see for these, uh, like for instance, the World Cup trophy, it fits perfectly into a keyhole. If you look at the Super Bowl trophy, it fits perfectly into the standard, old, like an OG keyhole. If you just typed in keyhole into Google Images, it's going to be the first thing that you see. Mm. And uh, it's because when you win, when you win, you get the phallus of Osiris. That's your reward. That's yeah. what you're winning. 
and this no, is totally all right. about penis worship. Yeah, it's all coming back to phallus worship. And a lot of the stuff with uh, with Joe Rogan and you talking about the Amanita muscaria mushroom, and that's that a lot of phallic symbolism goes back to just mushrooms in general. And obviously, for obvious reasons, because of the similarities in look. But um, yeah, uh, outside of that, the number eight, I, I'll just wrap up with the number eight conversation. Uh, numerologically, the significance could be the infinity symbol or the Taurus field. I mean, I think the Taurus field is probably the best one to go to for this group of people that were like for you guys, because that's where I think most of our minds could go. Um, some of you are talking about the bull. And I know a moment ago, Mario was just talking about Taurus. Uh, we have the Torah, which was corrupted by the Talmud. Like uh, we get into a lot of like what's going on here in this realm. And it keeps coming back to Taurus fields. Um, so I think that's equally as important when we're talking about what NASA calls planets, because clearly they're not what we're being shown. If you use a high powered uh, telescope, you're going to see they're just dancing luminaries. Um, so they're, they're literally moving lights. They're not physical. They're not gaseous, like they're plasma phenomenons in the sky. Um, so I think that's all really, really interesting stuff when you start to dive deeper into the Taurus fields and perhaps earth is just the local Taurus field. And we're like in a big Russian doll. Like that might actually be what this realm is just a mm. big Russian doll of like an egg within an egg, within an egg, within an egg. And on the final outside layer, you have Uranus. And that is the mythology story. You go from father sky and mother earth. And we are here in the physical realm called earth. It's super fascinating stuff to discuss, but when I think of the number eight, I quickly jump to Taurus Fields. No, that's understandable, and I agree with you. I think it is a, a nested doll situation, and which is interesting because if it's nested dolls and we're dealing with uh, toroidal fields, there the, it's the same hole in the middle, which is this Correct. gateway out of here, right? And so, yeah, this would be and the that's hyperbola that's the beautiful. The that's the beautiful conversation that could be had to kind of disregard the sigh up a flat earth and simultaneously not talk on the heliocentrism. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, we could go like that extra layer deep where it's like, wow, we might actually be in a toroidal uh, Russian doll where it's just, you know, an imprint of a Taurus field within another imprint within another imprint. And believe it or not, this imagery that we're getting that we could paint out through the the story of the mythologies where you have uranus and gaia and then it goes to saturn and then within saturn you have jupiter and then you have mars venus and then you you see how it's going and what we call the eye of jupiter might actually be mars and that is the great red spot and once you start talking on this stuff, you know, it really opens up the mind and it really allows us to expand deeper into what's going on here. Like what that optical illusion that we're seeing of the eye of Jupiter might actually be Mars. Mm. You start looking into the Old Testament and the God of the Old Testament who ruled this realm. Then it was Mars. It was all fire symbolism. It was all red symbolism. And uh, then we moved into Jupiter, which we spoke on earlier. But anyways, not to get off track, uh, the number eight is super powerful number and i'm into gematria and numerology that's a lot of my work i don't i don't know if i spoke on that just yet but i cover gematria and numerology quite often in my uh, in my art and number eight is huge um really really important number so when you're seeing the number 88 for instance it's kind of coming full circle to what we talked about earlier with the big dipper making the shape of the swastika and then uh you see the 88 symbolism with the national socialist party with the neo-nazis it's like they don't even know why they're wearing that patch they have no idea about the esoteric uh, side of it but the 88 is a super powerful number as well uh, like number back to sequence. the future so ever too. seeing that like, there you go yeah if you ever see that 88 symbolism you could twist the eight and make an infinity symbol above the uh, regular eight or in the center point and now you have a cross and that cross right there is like a club and you get into the playing cards and but that that club symbolism is really fascinating thing to decode and to to dive deeper into uh and I'm sure you guys could build off of it quite a bit, especially I think Mario brought up tarot. Anyone who's into tarot might get into the playing cards, cards of illumination. And that's a whole other decoding system that's really fun to play around with. Agreed. Yeah, it's a great system. I don't know that much about it. I have a friend who's really into it, but the stuff she's shown me, it's fascinating. Um, one thing I just wanted to add to what you're saying regarding the keyhole, when it comes to symbolism, I'm finding out the simplest way I could put it is that it's all about 
poles and holes. Truly, it's all about poles and holes. <laughs> that's what sex is. That's what everything kind of like filters down it's gonna to. Going to be my band name. Down to. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> uh, but it's true though, you know. So when we're talking about the North, there's a symbolic pole, hence the North Pole, hence the Pole Star, Polaris. But there's also a symbolic hole as well. Wherever there's a pole, it will seek it's a uh, compliment it'll seek a hole you know wow. what do you you're, think planting you're bringing up uh, is all about yeah you're bringing up something really funny because it reminds me of the candy cane which i believe is like a candy that's synonymous with christmas time right that's pretty much the time of the year that people eat candy canes uh, and i don't think that's just isolated to north america that's also europe and uh, several parts of the world even russia uh, but you think of the candy cane um, and you think that the flavor of candy canes is mint and mint is ment or mentis or mente, mm. which means the mind mm. and all is mind, right? And that red and white symbolism that you're getting with it, even if you don't want to talk about the Amanita Muscaria connection, you just, you have red tied to Mars, you have red tied to the lower chakra, you have white being like purity, being like, uh, you know, it's just so amazing how this stuff was coded in and given to us and children are a part of it and you know, as you decode it, you start to see like, damn, you know, this is all about mind control. It's all about reprogramming the subconscious unconsciously without people even knowing what's going on. Yes. Amazing. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Also with that eight that you were talking about and also with the, the sex symbols as well, the sun makes an eight and it's called an analemma, yeah, the, right? Yeah. The analemma. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And it's spelled yeah, and you think about the <laughs> you think of you think about the uh, <laughs> the candy cane. The candy cane could easily be the symbol of Saturn. Uh, Saturn holds the scythe, the Grim Reaper. Um, that's the cane. Uh, you know, you look into the crook and flail of ancient Egypt. You have that that crook, exactly. and that's all the same. It's all the same symbolism. Uh, super fascinating stuff to get into. I'm I'm really loving this conversation, guys. I have about like 20 minutes and I have to head out, but I just didn't want to bounce uh, without letting you know. So I'm, I have about 20 minutes more to hang out, but I really would love to do this again. Yeah, for sure. Same. Always do it again. I'm digging it, dude. Yeah, no, uh, I'm glad you brought up the crook with the candy cane. Uh, there's an amazing amount of symbolism that overlaps between Capricorn and Aries, the goat and the ram. And so with Capricorn and Christmas taking place uh, during uh, Capricorn season, I just see a lot of Christ symbolism in Aries. And obviously, you know, we're talking about the supposed birth of Christ um, with Christmas and everything else. So the crook, the shepherd's crook, you know, is is definitely appropriate. I think that's for sure what the candy cane is. But uh, I love your commentary, dude. This was great. And, and obviously, please chime in as much as you'd like before you take off. I don't know if you want to get back to this, Mario. We left off yeah, let's here. Do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so as I was saying, um, I actually, I can't remember where I left off, but let's get to the next slide. And also, <laughs> so I want to I wanna mention too, it's almost like a as above, so below, because you have the bigger one, then you have the little one. It's like, what are the chances that there was the similar formation, uh, a reflection kind of sort of of each other? You know, they complement oh, each other. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. Six, exactly. It's the 69. Yeah, 69. That's right. Exactly. That's what some people have said. Uh, our buddy Gabe says that the 6-9 of Cancer, um, he thinks it's the Dippers revolving around the Pole Star, which mm. I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, too, connecting it with all this North stuff because the Royal Ark in Freemasonry mm -hmm. has the 6-9 on the top, but it That's also right. has the Keystone, which has eight different letters, just like the eight different stars. Nice, wow. nice. Yeah. I love it, dude. I was just going to say, regarding the eight, you know, the four cardinal directions, but then if you're counting the directions in between those four directions, Northeast, Southeast, blah, blah, blah. Um, it makes eight different points. And I believe the main mm. chaos symbol has eight points emanating from the center, which to me, I kind of consider that to be a sacred center Northern symbol. Well, it's, it's also like one last thing to mention is it's the body on the cross. Like if you literally think oh, yeah. about it, it's, your, Oh, I it's see what you're saying. It's, yeah. It's your body is the cross and the cross is the cross. And Whoa. like that has everything to do with transcendence through the 33rd degree, like letting go of the material realm, becoming spirit. So Dude, that's an even deeper right. place to go. You know, yeah. the, the cross symbology of being bound to this flesh, like it's being bound to this realm. And that's why when they talk about that story at the end, it's like, 
you know, whether you want to talk about Jesus or any of the other plagiarized versions that lead up to it, it's just amazing to think about the transcendence past the physical realm and not caring anymore about the material, kind of just being able to let it all go and have forgiveness in the process. So I'm sure like deeper when you get into hermeticism or even into Freemasonry, they have a lot to say about the number eight. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. And I'm going to get into it later on in this presentation, but, you know, before the cross, my understanding is that most of um, what most people put in the ground to kind of symbolize their cultural sacred center was something phallic. It's like a standing stone or it's like an obelisk. Sometimes it's a tree. And I've heard a couple of different um, explanations on where the cross came from that the standing stone evolved from just having a uh, pillar of stone. And then once the church came around or whatever uh they just added a crossbar to the standing stone making it a cross i also just read that the druids would take their uh special tree their sacred tree oftentimes at the center of their community and they would chop off literally all of the branches so that it was just this phallic pillar or post made of wood and then they would get two large branches and literally tie it to that post therefore making a cross <laughs> So it's like the basis of the cross is that phallic symbol, you know. Uh, I just feel that's, like that's so that's so interesting. Uh, I, I've, that makes me think about Excalibur and pulling the sword out of the stone. Like that's really a like a really important story when it comes to language linguistics. Like that's perhaps a, a deeper like an analogy, if you will, for how language was developed. When you think of how language develop was developed, it's obviously vibrational frequencies all coming together, but perhaps the sky was spelling out the symbols the logos that became the letters and pulling the sword out of the stone is almost like pulling the tones out of the uh you know what i'm saying like it's fucking super deep but... no dude you got it i just finished reading a book about this basically i think what oh, really have what's, always what's done... the book called because i'm trying to find more stuff on this and it's something that my mind is just kind of like piecing together yeah, there's a few I could recommend. Um, we should definitely get each other's contact info. I think I have your email now uh, because of the show, Beautiful. Juan sending the link. So I'll send you a link. But my understanding is that what people have always wanted to do is they've wanted to reflect the heavens on earth. So what they perceive mm -hmm. the heavens to look like, what the structure was in the night sky, um, that's what they believe they should base their community off of and how they should structure everything, including the, their home and everything else. So if people were having an understanding of the northern sky and then suddenly it switched to being more of a uh, heliocentric ecliptic thing, that kind of changed everything because their perception of what was going on in the heavens had changed. And so there's absolutely <laughs> this as above, so below relationship, uh, which I actually have a couple images later in the presentation that kind of gets into that a little bit. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here you can see Ursa Major, right? And Ursa Minor. Just want to show you Great Bear, Little Bear, um, just for that context, basically. But we can cruise forward. Um, and we already saw this slide, but this is a review for people here. But if, in case you weren't aware, Ursa Major going around Polaris four times a year. If you just took a snapshot, it creates the swastika. And I would argue personally that this is actually where we get the shape of the number seven from. And so I believe the shape of number seven literally comes from Ursa Major. And so hence the seven stars and everything else. Um, I did a presentation on a lot of this stuff a while back, kind of getting into that, showing the receipts, if you will. But I think the number seven comes from the swastika and from Ursa Major. And then if we go to the next slide, you'll just see, you know, a lot of stars around the North Star showing you um, what that looks like, this rotation in the heavens symbolic of a wheel or a mill or a top many 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 things have been compared uh to this rotation right um but you know the north pole just in and of itself if you want to go through to the next slide um it's amazing that a lot of modern maps they clip the poles <laughs> so you don't really see what's going on if you just look at a horizontal map a lot of times the mm. northernmost part of the North Pole of what's going on up there is clipped. You can't see it. And then the southernmost part, the South Pole, it's clipped. I think this is all strategically done. And I'm sure you guys here are aware of this, but I just want to say that the map is not the terrain. And so there are so many maps out there. I don't even know if we have an accurate map still to this day, you know? So I'm skeptical of Google Maps. 
my personal you're, opinion is... You're looking is, at one. <laughs> <laughs> my that, personal that's opinion, probably more accurate than the shit that we get to see. <laughs> word, dude. I, I, I hear you, you know. I think maybe the most accurate map is what I showed earlier, the circle with the dot right in the middle. And it's just like, hey, that's where you are. Yeah. Get used to it sort of thing, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, the map is not the terrain. And so the northern part of our plane of our world of earth there's so many secrets someone brought up hyperborea earlier that's obviously part of the conversation Mm -hmm. i already brought up the garden of eden sort of concept so that means that there's an abundance that's connected to the northern part of where we live you know uh, i call it the fountain of youth sometimes too or the holy grail i think this is where you're going to find the philosopher's stone as well sometimes these seven um original creative energies that came from the north have been referred to as fountain spirits, which I think is interesting and kind of plays into this fountain of youth concept. As I was saying earlier, um, the mountain or the tree, you know, is very much related to Northern symbolism, the world tree, Yggdrasil, as I already mentioned as well, uh, wherever there's a pole, there's a hole. And so I think that there's just so much kind of baked into what's going on at the North that I feel like uh, it unlocks a lot of secrets once you really get into it. Um, and if we move forward, it's just a picture of the Northern Lights. I want to add really and, quickly, Mario, like, because we're talking, John D contributed, to, you know, he's involved in this particular depiction of this black rock, 33 miles long, no dirt on it, almost like some sort of monolith in the middle of nowhere. It's fully magnetic. Well, when I look at this, I think about that d- depiction that I told you about where John D and Edward Kelly were shown God. And when they were shown God, he was what a whale with many yeah. eyes. And if you think about it, the blow hole is the North Pole, and then the many eyes could have been that that the stars circling around. So, but I just find it so interesting that when they were shown God, you don't think of a whale full of eyes, covered in eyes. No, you think of this old man, very Saturnian with the robe old guy sitting on some throne somewhere you don't think of a whale which is is interesting because the whale symbolism it's the alchemical vessel it's the one that transforms you know you got pinocchio uh, you have jonah you have all these things where it's like they're in the belly of the beast type of thing and maybe maybe the world this this realm that we're in is that alchemical vessel and we're shot out through the blowhole in some some sort of way after we're being done alchemically transformed you know (laughs) transmuted right right yeah no exactly well that put. makes so I, much sense yeah, it, it is dude for sure <laughs> uh so the northern lights was for me to just to show the uh, magnetosphere and that this is why the northern lights even exist as a phenomenon but it's because there's a literally uh there's an opening or a hole at the northern part of the sky and this plane and i think you're right Waters Above uh, with the nested um, dolls sort of concept. What a better name, Waters Above. (laughs) How synchronistic, right? The Waters Above, as above, so below. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. The old original goddess. intentional name. Yeah, the old original goddess that was associated with the northern sky, um, she was often compared to a ship. And so uh, a celestial ship of the north basically. And so there's lots of water symbolism at the Northern sky as well. And like I said earlier, um, sometimes the seven stars of Ursa major and minor were compared to seven sailors, basically her sailors Mm. essentially. And so I really think a lot of water symbolism, especially like in these forests, because when you, the trees are what bring the rain and Mm. that's like a super, you know, like unspoken about concept, but like you don't have, rain and deserts because there's no trees but arguably we've had shifts in our realm where places that were once deserts were amazing lush you know uh, lands of grass and you had you had these uh evergreens that you're seeing in that picture moments ago right. uh, there's even a theory that the pier- the plateau the giza plateau that whole area um there was a moment and perhaps there was individuals magicians magi of sorts that literally converted the they did some sort of ritual with the pyramids or just by implementing the power of the technology of the pyramids converted that whole area from being this lush beautiful green land to sucking all the water out of the land and turning it into what we call oil 
Mm. And that like blew my mind because I'm like, holy shit, like, well, that area does have a fuck ton of oil. And this again, it's theoretical, obviously. There's no way that I could prove this. And if I spoke to normal people about it, they would think it's insane. But, um, mm. you know, it, there's something clear going on with the pyramids where they're a technology. They're, that's not just a fucking structure. That's something that connects as above below with the cosmos. And it, it, it is a working power plant of sorts. It's not a tomb. Right, exactly, dude. No, I'm right there with you. You know, whether you're talking about a building, a pyramid, a mountain, a mound, uh, a standing stone, whatever, I really feel like all of these things are expressions of this sacred center concept. And so mm-hmm. when my understanding is that people back in the day, way back in the day, pre-heliocentrism and stuff, they believed it was very important to locate the cultural center of your people. So if you lived on an island, you knew exactly where the middle of the island was. If you had a region and your people uh, took up a certain amount of space within a country or continent, you knew exactly where the center of your borders were. And at this center, they would oftentimes have a sacred stone, a sacred tree, you know, a mound of some sort, and they would congregate there and they would create new laws and they would have celebrations and they would do rituals and everything else. And once this cultural center was lost or destroyed, my understanding is this is or was the beginning of the end for a lot of people. And there's still cultural sites like this in the world, like in Jerusalem, the Dome of the Rock or uh, in Mecca, you know, in Saudi Arabia, where everybody from all over the world, they're coming just to be around this one sacred center and honor it. Or to and kiss it. something that... <laughs> to kiss it to touch it to do whatever you want yeah yeah exactly and so i think the pyramids uh maybe um are kind of a a similar sort of thing with that and there's like a micro macrocosm of feng shui in your home so instead of the big city in the home the center of the home is important for that whole feng shui that's right and you know what the center of the home used to be it used to be the hearth it was the fire And so a lot of people way back in the day, they lived in circular structures. They had huts or they had a tent (laughs) or a teepee or something like that, which I have photos of in this presentation because it it aligns with all this stuff. And they would put the fire right in the middle. And then you would have the opening at the very top where the fire or the smoke, rather the heat um, actually, you know, can escape, you know? And so It's, um, it's really amazing that you bring that up because Kanye West was trying to build these homes that are like domes that are like circular (laughs) dome shaped (laughs) And they like the city of uh, whatever, Los Angeles, wherever he was trying to do it, they shut down the project and they didn't want him to get they didn't want him to be able to do it. And uh, he had the resources, he had the money, he clearly has the connections. But uh, he was literally talking about it, like based on the frequency and your well-being and aligning your chakras. And like he, he knows what's up, obviously, but I'm surprised he's getting away with even talking about it. And it makes sense that they wouldn't allow him to build the homes. Because he wanted to build it for homeless people, actually. It was like part Mm. of his academy, but then it was also to build structures for homeless people to be able to have a place to um, to go. And I want to add this real quick before you go, Watersville. I don't know how much longer you have, but this is what I picture the elites doing when when they're putting all this pulse. And I know we talked about the phallus and the pulse symbolism. And it just makes me think of this scene. I don't know if you guys can hear this. Let me know. You guys hear this? Mm-hmm. It's a good idea. This right? is what it, this is the elites. Whenever they when they whenever they're working on their symbolism, making their movies or whatever, this is what they're thinking right now. Monogamy is sexual slavery. She got an exquisite pussy. Well, how about my exquisite <laughs> erection, huh? Eva, what do you think? You like my exquisite exquisite erection? Hmm? Do you like my erection selection? What do you think, Eva? Yeah, you gonna take it? You gonna take that dick? <laughs> You gonna take that dick? Huh? That's the elites I'll right pop there. Pop a piece of my dick. Oh yeah, I'll fix him to fuck you. I won't fuck you. That's very oh, is it Osiris or who, who's the one that loses the phallus in the Egyptian myth? He's yeah. like break off a piece of this That's dick. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So very phallusy. I'm gonna get it all up. In <laughs> well, like with with Christmas, just talking about where that's coming from. It's coming from the Yule log as well. And the Yule log was a phallic. And I believe this is where we get the Illuminati OK from. Because if you look at the old oak tree, oak and OK sound very similar. Druid actually means oak. Oaks were Mm -hmm. very much worshipped. And if you look at the Yule log, 
it has three candles on it. So when you throw up that OK sign, that Illuminati OK sign, you got three fingers. Yeah, I'm not going to throw it up because I know someone will screenshot it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it for you, bro. I'll do it for you. People already say I do it on. They're like, look at them, the fingers. So I got to go like this, dude. The, I, oh, is that what that means? Because I didn't know what you were talking I thought that was like. Yes. Uh, I thought it was like Masonic just to grab your glasses. No, no. It's like this. And then you posted, oh. that, pic- you posted that picture when we did that episode. And I was like, this because I, I, I didn't even. I didn't even um, yeah, even dude. There. It's people. People are ridiculous. So I'm. I'm always like adjusting my glasses like this. <laughs> but how it's all like yeah. sexual symbolism. Even the Temple of Solomon. If you look at it, uh, I heard that was also like uh, sexy, sexy time. It's oh, funny yeah. that you bring that up because I was just doing a live stream uh, an hour or so before I, I got on this, and uh, people were talking about these hand symbols, and I was talking about how each finger is associated with one of the planets or one of the, you know, and so that pointer finger is the Jupiter finger, and the the thumb is the Mars finger, and you're joining them together, and this could also be considered like if you want to dive deeper. You have mudras, and mudras are extremely powerful. This is not like negative. This is not Illuminati stuff. Um, When they are conjoining the fingers the way they're doing it and holding the hand out and all of that, that's all very intentional. And when they hold their hand up versus holding their hand down, that changes the energy. But um, if you look at Stephen Curry, uh, Steph Curry, his... He has a company, I believe, some sort of merchandise company, and their logo is literally just the 666 uh, logo. It's like what you're calling the the OK symbol. Um, and it's amazing because this is it's very obvious. It's not even as obvious. Or, I mean, I think the OK symbol we do with our hands is less obvious. But the Steph Curry uh, merchandise logo, I thought that was really funny how he went forward with that because... Uh, it's like, dude, you're not hiding shit, <laughs> and you're one of the most famous basketball players of our time. Uh, but yeah, whenever you're looking at people connect fingers or doing any of these kind of shit with their hands when you're thinking of the elite, always bring it back to the finger uh, that is associated with the planet. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and then I, sh- I should go, but that the horns logo where they're holding up like the the rock symbol, you know, and they have the pinky, the pointer finger, and holding the thumb out. That's super, super important because the the fingers they're holding down are the Saturn finger and the sun finger. And they're showing that's all ritual. You know, all of these big events that happen in our world are tied to eclipses, the eclipsing. So you could consider that as a side conversation, but they're holding up the three fingers that rule the world. They're holding up the Jupiter finger. They're holding up the Mars finger and they're holding up the Mercury finger. And Mercury is associated with the financial system, with the fiat money, money created out of thin air. It's the prince of the power of the air. And that's also tied to the caduceus with the medical institution and that fraud, uh, which is also tied to the supplement industry and pharmaceuticals. So that Mercury is a really heavy hitter, like I mentioned earlier, because that's the one we deal with as humans. And then Jupiter is just the god of this age, the one that we can call Satan. And then the the Mars finger is the thumb, and Mars is the war machine, and we could connect that to Washington D.C. Then you have the Vatican connected to uh, Jupiter, and or Jupiter, who is G Zeus, and then you connect it to the the pinky finger, and and it makes sense now. Like, what are the three things that run this world? It's the City of London with banking, Washington D.C. with war, uh, the war machine, and uh, then you have uh, Vatican with religion, with belief, externalized belief, and removing people away from the, their connections in nature, which ultimately is the most important part of all of that. It's removing people from nature. And everything that Mario has talked about thus far has been like talking about a human or a being at one time that was connected to nature. Uh, everything coming back to the center of the house, building the oven in the center, having the community, like all of that stuff was more naturist. Um, and now if you look and you talk with people about things, they associate the naturist side of things with paganism and they again attempt to demonize it. Uh, and that's like, you know, those are always like the fine line of learning is to not get caught up in the demonization and actually see a little bit deeper. Like I attempted to do a moment ago with the hand symbol to not just look at it as if it's this Illuminati hand symbol and go, oh, maybe it's actually showing you a deeper. Yeah, exactly. You're connecting that Jupiter finger with the Mars finger and you're holding up the sun, Mercury and uh, Saturn. It's really important. The Holy Trinity. That's right. Yeah, Damn. exactly. Before you go real quick, I just want to say uh, the Yule log, having the three um, candles in there, 
you know, uh, three and tree are just one letter apart. And so I think there's a correspondence between threes and trees. And it just reminds me of uh, Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great, mm. you know what I mean? And um, I, I see that he's very much connected to a phallic polar symbolism, which is why he's connected with the caduceus and everything else. And when I see uh, Hermes, you know, I interpret him as traveling between realms via this hyperbola in the middle 100%. of this nested egg sort of situation that we're talking about. And so his you're absolutely role, right. His Mercury role was the hitter. voice between, yeah, his, he, his role was the voice between the mortals and the gods. Yep. That's right. That's literally yeah, exactly. what he is. So he's the, he's kind of like our mediator. He is the Trinity. If you think about it, like I agree. One is the universe. Two is duality or the conjoining of the relation, start the relationship of divine masculine, divine feminine. And then three is the mediator. The one who makes the, translations between one and two having misunderstandings or not being able to understand each other so mercury is a necessity you know like mastering mm -hmm. the teachings of the of hermes or thoth or enoch or whatever you want to call it. like i think it's really funny how kendrick lamar named his firstborn son enoch <laughs> <laughs> like these guys know so much and they just reveal it all to you and i i love it because i'm past the judgment zone of these elites and now i'm just purely a decoder and it's so fun now to just decode and to not get so caught up in the the blame game and the pointing fingers and it allows you to really clearly see what's happening but hey guys i've really enjoyed this discussion and donut thank you so much for uh inviting me and as well juan and mario is so great to meet you i'm gonna pull up really your your channel here real quick. Can you let people know where they can find you? You got a great YouTube channel. Water is above. And it's all about crypto, Gematria, all that good stuff. Make sure you subscribe. But yeah, dude, I would love to have you on again. This is really fun. And you just came in swinging, bro. Going hard in the paint. <laughs> Black belt stuff. Make sure to check him out. Is there anywhere else people can find yeah. you? So on my YouTube channel, I definitely speak more on cryptocurrency and its ties to mythology. So if people are interested in the mythological components that I've been talking about today, that's kind of been my masterwork and then bringing in the mythology with the uh, esoteric forms of astrology and gematria, which is decoding using a numerical alphanumerical cipher. Um, but yeah, I talk mostly about that kind of stuff, but every week, whether that's a Friday or Saturday, I make sure to do a live stream and on my live streams, I do not talk about crypto. So I'm only talking about this and they go on for a pretty long time. So I do those once a week and then kind of lock them up at the 24 hours, 48 hours later, just because of what, mm -hmm. what I talk about, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of band level material. So I, tr I, tr I have my own system going on, but gives everyone a little bit of a taste of everything I have going on in my mind. And um, also I do have a Patreon if people are interested in a podcast that I do that's uh, available there. But I really appreciate you guys having me on. It's amazing to have connected with you all and wishing you all a beautiful day and uh, much love. Take care. Take it easy, brother. Thank you for coming on, man. We'll have you on again very soon. I love this chat. Appreciate it. Appreciate Later, it. Man. Take care, guys. Bye. So that was Waters Above. Killing it. Donut didn't tell me he was a heavy hitter. We're going to have to have him back on again. That dude's great. Yeah, he was awesome. I just knew that was going to work out nice. <laughs> <laughs> Donut over here is like an alchemist. Like, okay, I'm going to add this guy to the conversation. And that's what I tell people because... Sometimes I'll go on like some banger of an episode and I'll have people hit me up like, dude, why didn't you invite me? I was like, dude, it's an alchemical process. It's not always a hitter. You know what I'm saying? It's not always a banger when you have certain people vibing with each other and you got to be very meticulous. And uh, yeah, this is going to be one of those shows where people are like, oh, this is crazy. So <laughs> awesome stuff. Make sure to check them out. And Mario, we left off here with the Northern Lights. We talked about the trees bring in the water. Uh, we talked about the waters above, how we were talking about that. Uh, continue, brother. Right, right, right on, man. Well, I'm glad waters above brought up uh, tree symbolism a little bit. You know, if you obviously, if you chop down a tree, you look at the tree rings, it's very symbolic. You know, you have the sacred center where everything emanates from. And when you look at a ripple in water, same sort of thing. Everybody knows what happened when you throw uh, a little pebble in water right there's these, these ripples you know reminds me very much of plato's atlantis reminds me very much of this sacred center concept we're getting into here with the north pole um but yeah you can proceed to the next slide 
And I noticed this a while back, but I think it's very, very interesting. So if you look at a lot of older maps, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this, but this word, Septon Trio, uh, is often at the northernmost part of the map. Septon, as in septenary, as in seven. So this is a reference to the number seven. So it's uh, this word represents or means of the north. And this is symbolic of the seven stars that you're going to find in the northern sky, Ursa Major and Minor. So the number seven really has so many northern connections. It really blows my mind, but it's just part of the tradition of everything too. So people have understood this for a long time. So the fact that that's there, I think makes perfect sense. So, um, yeah, so proceed. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this image. This is Yggdrasil. This is the world tree. Very symbolic of everything that I've been trying to get at with this central pole going up to the northern sky in the middle of the plane or whatever you want to refer to it as. This is the world axis, right? And this world axis is very, very significant. I've done a couple of presentations on it and the um, just the meaning behind it and uh, some of the history behind it as well and how people viewed it. If they're interested in that information, they can check that out. But essentially, this pillar, this post, this tree, to me, it's symbolic of two main things, or maybe three things. It's what separates the heavens from earth, but it's also what binds heaven and earth. And so it is a separator and a connector. It's also a symbolic bridge. And so now, whenever I see trees, you know, or a lot of flowers, and I'm just going on a walk or whatever, they're all little bridges to heaven, honestly, because they just shoot up. And so I think in a lot of ways, tree symbolism, you know, all trees are kind of the world tree. They're all expressions of this world tree. And so they're all expressions of this bridge from earth to heaven. It kind of reminds me of Jack and the Beanstalk in a way, you know, just this plant that just keeps on growing and growing and takes you to the heavens, takes you to the sky. Right. Um, and so I explained a couple of other things that I have here in my notes already, but proceed to the next slide regarding world tree symbolism so right here it says because its roots delve into the soil and its branches stretch up to the skies the tree is universally regarded as a symbol of the relationships established between heaven and earth in this sense trees possess the character of centers to the degree that the world tree is synonymous with the world axis so whenever you see world tree or even a tree for that matter i think of this axis mundi you know, this uh, pole from the northern part of our plane to the northern sky. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that this pole has basically taken on a lot of different names and expressions over the ages. So my first introduction to it with my research material is the axis mundi, the world axis. But it's also a pole. It's a column. It's a pillar. It's a post. I believe this is where we get postage from and the post office um, because Hermes, Mercury, the messenger of the gods, uses this post to go between realms. As I've mentioned, it's already the world tree. Uh, it's a phallus, right, as we've been talking about. This is a very curious one, but it's also been referred to as a thigh or uh, a leg. Sometimes it's the thigh of a bull. Um it's also been referenced as a staff or a scepter, sept as in septenary, as in seven. Uh, it's an obelisk or a tower. Sometimes it's a sword or a spear. As I mentioned, it's a bridge, stairway, or ladder as well. I think all of these are appropriate, personally. Um, and so if you cruise to the next slide, you'll see a tower, an obelisk, and a standing stone. These are all symbolic of the same thing, and it's this axis mundi symbolism and so therefore if you go to the next slide taking all of that into account it makes a lot of sense that when you're looking at the world tree and you're looking at uh what's going on with the christmas tree i think what we're doing here is i think we're just basically putting the north star on top of the world tree i think that's the symbolism um and so you're bringing the world tree into your home and it's debatable, in my opinion, whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. You're, you know, people way back in the day, they would not have chopped down their family tree or their world tree. You know, they wanted it to still be in the ground, in the soil, uh, roots intact, all that kind of stuff. 
But long story short, I think the Christmas tree is the world tree, and that is the North Star uh, at the very top. And if you didn't know any better, if you didn't look into it, you wouldn't realize, if you want to go to the next slide, that um, there are North Star and Polar deities. Um, And so this is kind of lost to a lot of people because a lot of deities that are considered to be solar, um, not all of them, but some of them were actually polar deities, um, more geocentric deities, and then their meaning kind of got flipped or switched or whatever. So this is from the Vedic Pantheon. This is uh, Durva. And what do you know? Durva is meditating in front of a world tree. And so literally this deity is openly connected to the North Star. So it's being visited by Vishnu right now. And so um, a lot of North Star polar deities have this relationship to the pole, to the phallus, to the tree. And so uh, oftentimes you'll see Buddha meditating in front of a world tree. I think this is pretty much all of the same symbolism. But uh, it is openly regarded that the North Star and this deity that's sitting down right there, um, that they have a relationship together, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And so if you go to the next slide, this is uh, Ptah. So this is from the Egyptian pantheon. Ptah has a staff that they're holding right in front of them. This staff is symbolic of the same pole that I've been going on about. And so nowadays, most people refer to Ptah, I believe, as a solar deity, but it was once understood as a polar deity. And uh, it's also my understanding that Ptah is where we get the Oscar statue from. It looks very, very similar. (laughs) Yeah, this is the first deity that really set me off on this whole entire concept of there being polar gods, essentially. And so there's this book that I read from, I think it was 1893, called The Night of the Gods by John O'Neill. And he has a whole entire chapter called Polar versus Solar Worship. And he gets into all of these examples of different gods that were once polar deities who are now solar deities, which I just find mind blowing. Uh, The fact that there's like a classification of deity that we just don't really talk about in the modern world. Mm. But when you look at him, does he look more solar? Or does he look more polar? You think that you think you this know. statue is like you are gonna take that dick? You think he was saying that too, bro? <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. We need that little uh, caption right there. One hundred percent. Oh man. Um, so the next deity that I have, I just have three examples of these gods. Uh, this deity is referred to as Miyokin, and he is a Japanese deity. He is openly um, he openly corresponds to the North Star as well. So if you didn't know any better, you would look at the disc behind uh, behind this figure's head and you would probably think that it's the moon. You know, maybe some people would see it as solar, but it's actually a polar symbol as in the pole star. And so these seven serpents behind his head, symbolic of the seven uh, stars of Ursa Major or Ursa Minor, literally everything that he's holding as well is a polar symbol. You wouldn't know it. Uh, but the sword is a polar symbol. Mm-hmm. The wheel is also a polar symbol. And then the pen to paper is a polar symbol as well. Think of the pen and just what the pen represents. Mm-hmm. It's almost like something coming from on high and, um, you know, you're transcribing something into 2D. But where it came from was from a higher realm. You oh, know? dude, you're stealing you're almost... my stuff now, brother. Oh, He's speaking Uh-oh. my language now, man. <laughs> the whole platonic solid idea with the, yeah, with the manifestation, 100%. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, this dude, is my nipples good. are so hard right now, dude. When, you, when, you, when you're talking about it, like, where did I it love come from? That. Yeah, oof. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, Miyokin is a polar deity. And I would say by extension, Mercury Mercury Hermes is a polar deity. So that's kind of where I stand with that. And the symbolism to me just adds up and makes sense that that would even be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to cruise to the next slide. And this is just like a, um, you know, a very simple hut, uh, TP sort of thing. And it's just so easy to not acknowledge the symbolism behind this. But I guarantee you they had a fire right there in the middle. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just how people rolled. This was the deal. And I was delighted to see uh, on the next page, I was at a friend's house and I was just going through their library and they had a book called Earth and Sky, Visions of the Cosmos in Native American Folklore. And they got into this idea that this structure, as simple as it is, was actually mirroring the heavens. And here you could see the northern sky down below and then you can see Polaris right in the middle. 
And so they were saying that this was deliberate. This uh, it's it's so simple and elegant, but there was a rhyme and reason behind making your home this way. You know, it was your it was the center, it was the focus. You know, it's where everybody would gather around. And so uh, I think Donut said it, but yeah, there is this microcosm, macrocosm thing kind of going on. You well, want to match- also see that in uh, Stonehenge. There's reports that saying that Stonehenge had a dome over it before and it looked very similar to the disneyland ball oh really That's interesting time traveling that ball and you can even go into how time traveling is kind of connected as a portal with polaris and the key and all that and yeah, also absolutely I'll- I want to add because I find it really peculiar that they that they have east on here and it makes me think of the Masonic tracing board that has east at the top for some reason. And then wow. obviously you have Jacob's ladder there, but there is this idea that the so we're talking about occulted symbolism, we're talking about inversions, we're talking about all the, what if they're pointing all these things to see north is to the left here. It's not to mm-hmm. the, you know, you know, it's not to the, to the top. What if even directions have been occulted? Because we're talking about John D mm-hmm. was at the core, at the forefront of, uh, of cartography. I mean, what if secret societies even hijacked that and they've misled humanity in the wrong direction this entire time and these directions that we're presented with, the cardinal directions, aren't even the directions that they say it, they are, right? And I mean, I Dude, don't know I what, what I don't know what role that would play in in a in a bigger picture. But I mean, you're seeing it here. This is a Masonic tracing board, and the east is up top. So yeah, yeah, I've heard this before. I uh, how the east is actually upwards, and it's that's very very fascinating because the cornerstone. When it gets laid, I believe it's facing the northeast um, when the Masonic, you know, uh, Capitol Dome was built, all the cornerstones. So that's very fascinating. It is. And I said this earlier, but one of the things I've read is that you go your soul, if this all checks out, obviously, (laughs) upon death, (laughs) some people believe your soul goes eastward but in a uh, spiraling motion to go oh, north, oh. basically. So it makes me think of that. But I'm glad you pulled this up. And if you don't mind keeping it up for... I mean, this is what that symbolizes two. right here, because you have that, that, yeah. that spiraling kind of... Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. So we have the sun on the left-hand side. We have the moon with seven stars on the right-hand side, which I think is always fascinating. And then we have this eye in the middle. And so th- to me, this is just saying that we the system that we live in here there are three main components that um, for reckoning purposes and maybe for divinatory purposes and whatnot need to be understood. The sun, the moon, and then the pole star, in my opinion. So solar, lunar, polar. I think that all, this whole system as a trinity needs to be acknowledged because they all play their own separate part in everything. Interesting. Yeah, I just... Yeah, that, that's how I see it. And then you have the key, right? You have Jacob's ladder. You have that obscured pillar, it's not, sometimes it's not always in the middle. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit more to one side than it is to the other. And then you have the key symbolism in there. You have, who is it? Benjamin Franklin with the key and the kite. Right. Is that, is that yep. the guy? So, I mean, uh, and then I don't know. I forgot who mentioned earlier, but the electromagnetic aspect of it all, that North pole, the compass is always pointing to the North. I have something really groundbreaking that shook me to my core that I want to get into here soon once we're wrapped up with, with your presentation, Mario. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think there's just a few slides left. Um, and so I think it's interesting that, you know, earlier people who were more geocentric, who were more concerned about the northern sky, would have their hearth in the middle, would have their fire in the middle. So therefore, the middle of their home was the symbolic portal uh, gateway out of there, just like the northern sky and then Santa, what does he do symbolically, mythologically, you know, at least the modern narrative of things? He goes through the chimney. He That's where he enters the home and that's where he exits the home. Exactly like what I was talking about with these simple structures of the home. And so to me, the man from the north symbolically entering in from like potentially the northern part of your home, 
Uh, obviously, the way we design houses now, it's not circular or whatever. But I think that that's the correspondence that we're kind of dealing with, basically. Um, so that was intriguing. That was something I hadn't thought about. He's got kids in here. You see this? And and my son, because yeah. cause kids, right? Some people have mixed feelings about this, but Santa Claus, some people say it's like psychological torture for kids. Some people say it's the first lie. It's, it's traumatizing to kids, whatever. I mean, you raise your kid. One thing I've learned a, a, of being a parent is you don't tell other people how to raise their kids. So to each their I own. That, yeah. Now, th- my son, he's four years old. He asked me a very interesting question. He said, hey, dad, how is Santa Claus going to get into the house if we don't have a chimney? Right. And we've painted a Santa Claus being this kind of wizard. He's got magic and all that stuff. So we ended up buying this thing. We went to this local market and there was a lady who was selling magical keys where you hang them up on your doorknob. Right. For Santa Claus. And that's the that's since we don't have a chimney. This is the magical key that Santa Claus uses to get into the house. But he was asking me, he's like, Dad, where's he going to... He's like looking at our roof. He's like, where's he going to come in through? We don't have a chimney. And I'm like, damn, these kids, bro, they, be, they, they think about it all. <laughs> they think about it all. <laughs> but he was asking, he was like, hey, where where's he going to come? I was like, well, we're going to have to figure that one out. It was weird in school, in elementary school, because I never celebrated Christmas. Oh, so, you're Jewish, right? You know. <laughs> yeah, so like all the kids were like Santa Claus. And I knew like, if I didn't say nothing, I was just like, okay. And then I remember I'd go visit them on Christmas. They showed me all the presents and the parents would just stare at me like this Jew better not tell her. Oh, cause, like, cause, cause you guys know. Yeah. They knew that, like I knew they knew, I knew they knew that I knew. And like, <laughs> it was just so awkward. Yeah. Like don't reveal it. So what, what would they teach you growing? It was just like, would you got, you guys don't even get gifts or anything. Right. No, we got Hanukkah, uh, and we would get one gift every night. And then when I became a man at 13 years old, it ended. Oh, damn. That's... <laughs> but I got to celebrate Christmas um, a few times, and I love it. It's my favorite. The, the Christmas tree, all the presents. Oh, yeah. so fun. Did you guys have a uh, seven candled menorah or a nine candled menorah? Do you remember by chance? Yeah, it was the uh, eight candle, but with nine, oh, okay. it's the middle one is the where you light the other ones. Mm. Oh, gotcha. For the eight days. And the seven is for Kwanzaa, but I've heard other like stories. Like there's a lot of weird stories. Like Christopher Columbus saw a UFO of a menorah <laughs> floating. So oh, what? wow. Yeah. Interesting. Never what heard of that. What the heck? Never heard, neither have I. Interesting. Yeah, so I was looking through old Santa paintings and drawings and stuff like that, and uh, I read an article about Santa originally wearing a green coat and a green hat and everything else, and I just pulled these images together because one of the things that links them all is, one, the green, but then also, two, they all have either a stick or a tree with them symbolic of this world axis in my opinion mm. and so uh they're all holding the tree or he has a stick especially the figure in the middle he looks like a traveler so again hermes mercury the messenger of the gods he's all about travel right and it's my understanding that this central pole is what they travel up and down around symbolically mythologically And so I see a lot of uh, hermetic symbolism with Santa and Hermes, that that energy Mercury is a shapeshifter. I see it everywhere. You know, I almost I think a lot of the deities are actually expressions of Mercury. Personally, I think a lot of things are expressions of Mercury, but people, including myself, just don't have a handle on how that could possibly be or whatever. But Mm -hmm. he is a traveler. And so he sees things. He does things. Being mercurial means that you're kind of like uh, you can kind of shape shift too into uh, different ways of looking at things or what have you. So I think mercurial symbolism is all over the Santa mythology. And then if you go to the next slide, you'll see Hermes and he's in between two pillars and he has his hand on one of the pillars because, as I've been saying, he absolutely corresponds with the pillar or the post or the phallus. This is like a long tradition people can look into. So all of this, at least in my opinion, kind of just adds up 
that Santa would be the deity that comes from the north where you can travel to other realms. Uh, he's this mystical figure. He comes into the symbolic northern part of your home via the chimney. And then these cards above, you know, he's actually literally holding that pole as well. He is a traveler. You know, he's not of this domain, basically. Um, and Hermes as well corresponds, if you want to go to the next slide, with Crossroads. And so I loved this illustration, him literally looking at this post and he's looking at which direction to go. Uh, sometimes Hermes is referred to as Lord of the Crossroads. And so there's a lot of symbolism relating Mer Mercury to this idea, including what's going on down below, which is called a Herm or a Herma for Hermes. So back in the day, I believe this statue is Greek in nature. Um, this is a Herma or Hermes. Are you allowed to show this? The... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's got that dick. <laughs> it does. Exactly right. Bro, so, I found the weirdest stuff, man, on uh, the phallic symbols with Peter, and it was so weird. I gotta, I gotta pull it up for you. It, please, dude. It, it freaked me out. I, I actually had to exit out. I had to exit out of it because I was like, "How? I don't even know how to cover it." But I'll, I'll pull. I'll find it because it's hilarious. Man. It's hilarious. I want to see it. it. It's a big deal, you know. So these used to publicly be at crossroads at intersections or at boundary lines again they're called a herma or her herma based off of hermes and so there's that phallic symbolism that i'm talking about and in and of itself the statue looks very phallic and so the last slide i have here the next one is basically kind of just you know attempting for me uh it's my attempt to kind of prove my point with mercury being associated with the pole so this is crowley's version of uh the magus the the magus the the magician and it, you could easily not notice it but look at the pole right behind the magician this is that stairway to heaven this is the axis mundi in my opinion mm -hmm. and it's number one which is basically the exact same symbolism and so this figure here corresponds with order um and corresponds with with travel so the full card to me is like chaos mm -hmm. or disorder the zero you know and then the one is kind of like separating uh there's this whole idea that chaos needed to be untangled or chaos needed to be separated in order for there to be even a place for us to exist and live for the elements to do their thing and everything else so that's kind of like one of the esoteric sort of things going on with the phallus or the pole itself once again it's this separation sort of idea and this connection sort of idea and i think that card kind of symbolizes that with that pole right behind him so yeah, so that's what I got, dude. I think Santa is a mercurial figure. <laughs> so uh, that's that's kind of my conclusion, thinking about it for the last handful of days. Obviously, I've seen a lot of stuff out there about Santa being related to Saturn and all that. And there's definitely stuff going on there, 100%. So I would not dismiss any of that. But that's kind of my take right now. So perfect segue. I have, I'm going to start off with some Daddy Manly P. Hall, The Occult Anatomy of Man. Very, very interesting read. I would recommend people to check it out. The entire system is an anatomical myth. For the heaven world of the ancients, the dome temple on the top of the mountain was the skull with its divine contents. This is the home of the gods in man. It is termed up because it occupies the northern end of the human spine. The temple of the gods who rule the earth is said to be at the north pole which also, by the way, is home of Santa Claus because the North Pole represents the positive end of the spinal column of the planetary lord. Santa Claus coming down the chimney with his sprig of evergreen, the Christmas tree, at the season of the year when nature is dead, has fine Masonic interpretation for those who wish to study it. And this is Manly P. Hall writing this too, by the way. And nice. he goes on to say... The brain is the upper room referred to in the Gospels where Jesus met his disciples. And it is said that the disciples themselves represent the 12 convolutions of the brain. It is these 12 convolutions which later send their messages by means of the nerves into the body below to convert the Gentiles or preach the gospel in Middle Earth. And he's talking, he, and this is a very interesting read, the Occult Anatomy of Man, where he relates all these myths, all these things to the microcosm, man. And like everything, bro, it's mind blowing. This this book, I don't want to say changed my life, but changed my outlook on on symbolism a lot. 
So these 12 convolutions gather around the central opening in the brain, the third ventricle, which is the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat, where between spreading the wings of the angels, Jehovah talks with the high priest and where both day and night of the Shekinah's glory hovers. From this point also, the spirit finally ascends from Golgotha, the place in the skull. It is a clairvoyant fact that the spirit not only leaves, but also enters the body through the crown of the head, probably giving rise to the story of Santa Claus and his chimney. So we have this idea of the rising Kundalini, Kundalini a little bit of, of Santa Claus. And that, you know, this is where he says the story originates from symbolically. And then I have one more before we get into the Santa Claus. The alchemical furnace was the human body. And he talks a lot about we are the philosopher's stone. We are this thing that intakes gold. We're reading these things and we're intaking it and we're making gold. This is the gold right now, this podcast. We're intaking these ideas and putting out the gold. Uh, we're transmuting ideas. We're reading these things and, and making art. That's, that's the gold. The alchemical furnace was the human body. The fire that burned in it was at the base of the spine. The chimney was the spinal cord up which the vapors passed to be gathered again and distilled in the brain. This was indeed a secret system brought to Europe from the Far East, where for centuries it has been considered the highest form of religion. We may call these occult truths the principles of operative spirit spirituality in contra contradistinction, contradistinction? Mm, to modern religion, which is made entirely of speculative theories. People do not dream that religion is sociological nor would they believe that their salvation d depends entirely on scientific uses of the life elements and forces within their bodies but in spite of all that may be said to the contrary such is is the case during the next few years much will be done to enlighten man concerning secret workings uh i don't know what that is his own parts and members so it's kind of getting mixed up but i wanted to add this because uh you know the chimney the spinal cord, the kundalini, it's all alchemical. And this brings me to my stuff on the OG, which I kind of sort of knew this, but when you actually start reading into it, it kind of blows your mind. But the OG, St. Nicholas, which is apparently where they got center klaus from but very interesting figure because he is a saint so saint nicholas of myra and notice it says traditionally 15th of march 270 to 6th of december 330 343 so tradition they don't really kind of know this is what they accept mm, kind of weird known as nicholas of bari was an early christian bishop of greek descent from maritime city of myra in asia minor during the time of the Roman Empire. So, because of the many miracles attributed to his intercession, he is also known as Nicholas the Wonder Worker. St. Nicholas is the patron saint of sailors, merchants, archers, repentant thieves, children, brewers, pawnbrokers, unmarried people, and students in various cities and countries around. So, again, this sailors, the water symbolism that we have there, his legendary habit of secret gift giving gave rise to the traditional model of Santa Claus, St. Nick through Center Claus. Now, we have this amalgamation of this saint. Even his colors are kind of red. You have the green in there, right? Got the white beard, very Santa Claus-like. And what stood out to me was earliest and one of the earliest attested and most famous incidents. He is said to have rescued three girls from being forced into prostitution by dropping a sack of gold coins through the window of their house each night for three nights so their father could pay a draw dowry for each of them. But it so did he pay somebody else to have intercourse with his daughters or how how I didn't understand how he actually saved them by doing this. But when I saw gold coins every night the one thing that's that clicked into me, I was like, was this dude an alchemist of some sorts? Was this dude transmuting this gold and giving it to this guy to then pay somebody else? You know, at least somebody he knew to have sex with this. I don't know. That was just kind of weird. Other early stories of him telling, uh, calming a storm at sea, mm. saving three innocent soldiers from wrongful execution, chopping down a tree possessed by a demon. Mm. 
And then this part here, in his youth, he has said to have made a pilgrimage to Egypt and Palestine. Now, this is very important to me. It stood out to me because a pilgrimage, if you look up the definition of pilgrimage, a journey often into an unknown and foreign place where a person goes in search of a new or expanded meaning about their self, others, nature, or a higher good through the experience. And then this part here, it can lead to a personal transformation after which the pilgrim returns to their daily life. This screamed to me when I saw this Egypt, Palestine. It screamed to me alchemy. What if this dude was initiated and he was some sort of adept? Because this is around right around the time, you know, we're talking about Hermes Trismegistus. This is around the time where alchemy was being implemented. And it started where? in Egypt. So this dude took a pilgrimage to Egypt, maybe perhaps to be initiated into these arts of alchemy. So I found that very interesting. Now, in early, this makes him an attendee at the first council of Nicaea. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, if you know the, the lore behind that, but then something that really just blew my wig back that I was like, what? And I was just reading this, just reading everything. Okay, sure. One of the things that have just blew my mind and like they kind of put it in here and I'm just like, uh, I'm like reading. I'm like, what, what in the world? It is said that in Myra, so he has relics, right? His body parts were scattered around very Egyptian in the, we were talking about the phallus symbolism. Well, the phallus was the one part they didn't find. Of, and I always get them mixed up, Osiris or Horus. I always get them mixed up. But, the, you know, when they chop them up and they spread his body everywhere. The phallus was the one part that they didn't find. But it is said that in Myra, or Mira, sorry, I've been saying that wrong. The relics of St. Nicholas each year exude a clear watery liquid which smelled like rose water called manna or mir, which was believed to be by, believed by the faithful to possess miraculous powers. So every day, every year, they collect this white substance from this dude's remains. And they were, they were moving his remains around to make sure that they, that they weren't robbed. But again, uh, right here, and then notice the thieves were not only afraid of being caught or chased after by the locals, but also the power of St. Nicholas himself. So these dudes are, again... It, this is the craziest thing. And, and they sell it on the website. You can buy once a year. They extract this manna, this white substance, once a year, every year from this dude's tomb. And when I read that, I was like, I was just thinking elixir of life, you know, the, the fountain of youth, et cetera, et cetera, because they serve it to you in these little bottles, right, with his face on it. It's all handmade, and they pass it around to different... From 1980 onwards, the man is formally extracted every May 9th. And there's different dates I've seen. Uh, the, one, the one I saw was December 6th, the Feast of Translation. So I was like, dude, what in the world? And it makes me think, why does Santa drink milk? Right? You leave him cookies and milk. Is that some, some pseudo Eucharist if you really think about it? Cookies and milk? Where'd that come from? You know what I'm saying? Like you leave them cookies away. And I always thought, cause you tell the kids, is this some sort of, again, pseudo Eucharist that they do is the liquid, the stuff that he's extracting here. Then we have the story of the history of the scent of the regular Santa Claus that we see where allegedly the depictions that we see of red and, and white come from Coca-Cola maybe with their first depictions of Santa and their, in their, commercials and whatnot so i found that super interesting where this guy that we that they say was where santa claus actually came from he is also described sometimes as the lord of the sea often described by modern greek scholars as a kind of christianized version of poseidon also very interesting that there's the connection there with the because again when the church came through they they took all these pagan gods that these they wanted to convert everybody and they put them in their pantheons or sort of. So that's how you get all these saints. But again, you have the cross here. Uh, this one's blue, but 
just just interesting connections that I saw. And if I wouldn't have started reading the the we keep idea page, I wouldn't have came across this. But I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Because uh, the white substance really got to me. I don't know if it's well, you know, the Coca Cola red and white Coca Cola company gave us the imagery in our head of the polar bears. You were talking about the polar bears of the fat Santa. St. Nick isn't fat. He is skinny. And that's where they're saying it's coming from. It doesn't really align up. And you're talking about him dropping the sack of gold. Well, Santa has that dropping sack. this right? sack and dick, bro. <laughs> he dropped that sack. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but the Coca-Cola dude, if I could – bring up uh just a couple images mm-hmm. real quick uh maybe you guys could add on to it but just stuff i'm looking at and the symbols and research I haven't really connected all the dots but you can see that the dots are there so here's the coca-cola dude's grave he's got all the freemasonic Whoa. gravestone it's the same color scheme and the coca-cola as- bot is very fallacy too if you think about it sure is it is very fallacy and another thing is like this burnt hair, this cologne. If you go back to, this is Elon Musk's burnt hair. If you go back to Egypt, they had this other thing called an alabastrum, which was very phallic shape. And it had the perfume in it as well. And it was the size of what a, a penis should maybe be that, that size. It's the same size. And this was to keep that liquid in it. But going to Coca-Cola, the red and white is definitely Templar logo, Templar symbolism, because they were known as the red and white and black. And KFC logo is the red and white. And you look at his gravestone, it's also got Freemasonic symbolism all over it. Um, But... Those are kind of the things I was connecting. This guy right here, another phallic, it looks like a gnome. This is called Priapus. I'm not sure if you heard of Priapus, but going into the, the phallic symbolism, this stuff is hilarious. It I cracks <laughs> me up. But they got this one right here where it's a gnome and it goes over. Well, this. I also yeah. want to add that in these cultures, they have these lifelike. So go up a little bit into the left, up into, into the left right there. So down one, down one, they would have rituals where they would have sexual intercourse with these, with these statues. And the people back then would marry statues. There was also that going on, but it was some sort of right to leave your bodily fluids on this statue or near it or whatever it was as some sort of offering to whatever usually it was pan or some sort of fertility or wilderness god or or nymph or whatever it was back then but yeah they were definitely doing that and show and and there's statues that were literally just they just had you know penis just hanging out yeah, no, exactly. I know there were some cults where that's how women would lose their virginity. Yes, yes, exactly. And it was the whole offering and leaving your bodily fluids on it to, uh, you know, as some sort of offering. Very interesting. Yeah, it gets so weird how much sex symbolism, even that thing that you were showing with the circle and the dot looks like a boob, right? And these were all very out there, you know, Um Freud talked about you got an anal personality and an oral personality that gets developed when you're a kid. Who said that? Freud. Okay. I believe that's Freud, Freudian psychology. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's why people like sucking on things all the time, going back to the nipple. That was his whole thing, but you could kind of see it with the clothes. We, from the gods that were all naked and now the religions today, it's all you got to cover up. If that's in the Middle East, you got to mm-hmm. cover up. If that's at going to uh, school, you got to wear the longer dresses um, here. And so you can kind of see the psychology of things changing. But that that's that white stuff, man. That's interesting. Um, if you're looking at these slides right here, I just got a bunch of stuff that we were talking about um, for going deep down the rabbit hole. 
So I have some other stuff, but I don't know if I should bring it up because it's got to do with the poll. And I was really excited when I had to come across it, Mario, because I know you like the, the poll talk and the northern symbolism. But maybe I'll bring up some stuff real quick on the topic of and we'll wrap it up with this and maybe we can get together again because I think this was really great. Uh, we touched on again the north pole where santa claus comes from a little bit of santa claus in there and i want to bring this in because i don't know what connection you know if any uh with the constellation of draco mario and the northern symbolism but on yeah. the on the topic of carl Jung, and this is shout out to alex rivera you can check out his books he's got the aeon i blog i'm gonna bring it up here real quick because he did let me use this aeon i i bring up his website real quick and he's got a couple of books he just came out with a new one actually and i had hit him up today to get permission to use this because i don't believe he's actually published this but this is his website the the aeon i.com and you can check out The Laurel Turns Green. Might be doing an episode with him soon on this. It's a book, is his latest book. He also wrote the, the Sun Lady Unveiled. And he also co-wrote the Baphomet Temple Mystery Unveiled with Tracy Twyman. So if you want to check that out, shout out to you, Alex. Thank you. And he, t he had some really interesting connections. Uh, Carl Jung in his book, Aeon. Uh, coincidentally, uh, A-I-O-N also connects the northern parts of the world with hell and is shocked by his own thought process. Now, this blew me back because this I think this I think we can use this as a segue for our next episode where turning. So this is Carl Jung because you mentioned Freud and there were contemporaries. So turning back to our, our text, I would emphasize by way of recapitulation that the internal fire is nothing other than the deuce absacontitis so it's hidden god who dwells at the north pole and this is the part that really stood out to me and reveals himself through magnetism his other synonym synonym is mercurius whose heart is to be found at the pole and who guides men on their perilous voyage over the sea of the world the idea that the whole machinery of the world is driven by the infernal fire at the North Pole, that this is hell, and that hell is a system of upper powers reflected in the lower. So, this is a shattering thought, but the same note is struck by Meister Eckhart when he says, on returning to his true self, he enters an abyss deeper than hell itself. Now, I think this is going to lead me down some other other research because the idea what really stood out to me reveals himself through magnetism we have that black rock at the north pole that is magnetic and then you have this sort of demiurge-esque figure that reveals himself through magnetism you have the draco constellation which is linked to serpent worship serpent being satan then you also have santa you have saturn you have chronos you have all these different connections there and the fact that through magnetism and that's something that they, they that that was hold the whole nikola tesla and all these guys of back then that they were messing with this sort of stuff that's right yeah exactly. and and what happened to them right they they kind of got clinton in a way <laughs> <laughs> and notice that some of the things they were working with very phallic very polar and then that bulb right on top that's like a classic sort of thing so i think that's fascinating the last few times i saw kind of tecla tesla uh imagery that's the first thing i noticed mm -hmm. but yeah mm -hmm. uh proceed with your thoughts man because i have some things to follow up with all this this is interesting we have the idea that enoch translated into heaven through the north Right? It's in the in second of Enoch 10. And hell is a black fire in the heavens of the north. We have, again, the black rock at that north pole. And he also goes on to say, And a bunch of witches, vampires, and pedophiles dwell there in torment with cruel angels 
carrying savage weapons while mercilessly torturing them, mercilessly torturing them forever. And I'm sorry, and then one Enoch 70, one through four, we see Enoch's spirit translated into heaven through the north. And we know that Enoch went through this alchemical transmutation where he went from regular man to this divine being to this angel that holds reality together. And I think maybe that's what they're pointing out with this north symbolism. This is how you ascend to that higher dimension where you're able to manipulate. What does Baphomet have on his forms? Coagulate and dissolve. Well, you dissolve through the North Pole and then you coagulate reality together and kind of form it. And right, that, that's what the watchers are. They're watching the divine alchemist at work. And I'm going to pull up some miscellaneous stuff here. And I just want to maybe plant a seed with this because I think this is what's going to lead me maybe to our next episode. But for we have the Nassines believe an ominous serpent watches over us from above and Hippolytus in refutation of all heresies. Eretus says that there is th that there are in the sky revolving that is, and I'm not going to try and say these words because this is uh, anyways, but he talks about a serpent being at the top. Now we have the serpent, the devil we have. I pulled up at the beginning. The UN map is from the top. For they suppose that towards the North Pole is situated the dragon, the serpent from the highest pole, looking upon all the objects and gazing on all the works of creation in order that nothing of the things that are being made may escape his notice. So he's some sort of gatekeeper, this, this demiurge serpent. We have the serpent in the space force symbolism. They literally have a serp, a cobra watching over the North pole, watching over the, the globe. And for all the stars in the firmament set, the pole of this luminary alone never sets, but care, careering higher above the horizon surveys and beholds all things that and none of the works of creation he says can escape his notice so the idea that something wicked is hovering around the north pole echoes through the ages down to the present the official flag of the united nations the view of the globe from a region of space above the north pole looking down and relates it to the biblical prophet isaiah who said that lucifer also exalts himself to the lofty positions in the north and that's isaiah 14 12 through 12 through 13 as mentioned earlier, the first century Christian leader, Ecclesia, Ecclesia, I'm sorry if I butchered that, believe that the war rages among the evil angels of the northern stars and therefore immortal nations are in a state of confusion. So may, that makes me think of the, the, the lights, the northern lights, right? There, there, there may be that back then they thought there were angels fighting. So, and then another one that I want to add, <clears throat> and I'll be quiet, but Zarathustra was also informed of an evil entity that comes from northern climates. And he has an exorcism ritual for expelling this demon, demonic northern entity. We have the Game of Thrones. What are they waiting for? Something to come from the north. So I don't know if they're trying to subliminally program us for something, but I just I'm trying to find a connection here and I'm and I'm I'm drawing blanks. But yeah, it was uh, again, Zarathustra talked about he had a an expelling this demonic, uh, uh, an exorcism ritual. And I don't know. What do you what do you think, Mario? <laughs> I love it, dude. This is awesome. This is a great thread. Um, there's so much to talk about with all of this. And I would love to do a part two at some point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um the material I'm getting into right now, and it's really starting to come together, is that I've been talking about this stairway to heaven concept, but there are people who viewed it as a stairway to hell, and that actually the northern sky is the underworld, and that they're one in the same, essentially, which I think is fascinating in and of itself, right? Um, but that uh, this idea of a mother of abominations or a chaos dragon, uh, Tiamat, uh, there's been a lot of different um, expressions of this. Uh, Tarawet from uh, Egyptian mythology, and she's in the northern sky as well. She's often holding, it's a hippopotamus with saggy tits, and she's holding a knife, right? And she's in the northern sky. Uh, there's this idea that a primordial mother who is uh, often like associated with monstrosities and abominations and everything exists in the northern sky, and that Draco is actually a woman. 
and that uh, I've also heard people talk about the Demiurge being symbolically more female than masculine, actually. And so this is the material I'm getting into right now, a Typhon. Uh, this is the Typhonian tradition. So when you really get into like some like more Western esoteric black magical stuff, they are way into this stuff, man. Tiamat, Typhon, you know, things like that. But she has this uh, place in the night sky, the northern sky, and she's often compared to both Draco and uh, the Ursa Major and Minor Constellations. So, um, yeah, so I just thought I would throw all of that out there. Uh, sometimes the northern sky is referred to as the tunnels of set. So I believe that's a um, Kenneth Grant sort of thing, post Crowley. He came up with that stuff. So a lot of Sethian traditions uh, are kind of associated with the northern sky as well. Um, and then I was just recently reading that um, the Egyptians referred to the northern sky as the abyss as well, which I think is fascinating and kind of lines up with the whole afterlife stuff. Interesting. So, yeah, this is a thread we can continue pulling at. Definitely. Absolutely. Donna, you have anything? I'm going to add one more thing and then we can get. Yeah, I mean, the abyss, I think it's all micro macrocosm because the abyss could also be in our psychology. Mm -hmm. And also that staircase, what if it could be the 33 vertebrae as the UN also has the 33 sections? So it just seems like a lot of different things. If I was going to add anything on it, just how this north always shows up with the sun cross symbolism, even the Thule society Thule means the north and they yes. have the four different corners Microsoft has the four different corners which has the same color scheme as Hyperborea and it's the little dipper in a sense because there's the four sevens the swastika in the Microsoft logo so it's just very very fascinating a lot of dots have been connected tonight and something for me to look into more it just seems to me that this whole north stuff with all the different cultures it's all pointing to kind of the same story whether that's traditional religions all throughout history to today with psychology and going into the subconscious the abyss it just seems like it even it, like i feel like psychology with freud and uh young and all this it's like creating your own religion in a sense going through there and these archetypes keep showing up and these stories that go on thousands and thousands of years they're all pointing to the same stuff so very fascinating i want to add one more thing before we get out of here the new age scholar april the conic when speaking of the periodic Gnostics spoke of the far north constellation Draco and its connection to Christ in the Gnostic New Age. According to the Paradics, the consequence of this primordial insurrection is the human spirits, the seeds of divine potential, are incarnated by the Dark Lords. The Dark Lord reigning over all creation is Kronos, the violent titan who quakes the earth and spews waters of Tartarus upward into the ocean. Kronos, the cannibal god who devours his own children, is identified as the craftsman, the demiurge, who brings forth human life only to destroy it. He is the father god who murders his children by eating them, trapping their spirits in the cosmos. This wretched wretched situation requires a drastic intervention from the two other levels of reality. The transcendent good and the upright divinities must do something to to later this horrible predicament and liberate the spirit. Here the paradic story takes on a decisively Christian flair. Following the narrative arc of the fourth gospel, the paradics taught that Christ was sent down from the good to save creation. And this is the part right here. Christ was a powerful entity that embodied all three levels of reality, the transcendent, the divine, and the human. When he was crucified, he joined the other celestial rulers as a god. And it is said in the fourth gospel, when the sun of man was lifted up like Moses lifted the serpent. He took control of the highest and brightest constellation, becoming fixed in the skies at the top of the celestial dome, the guardian god of the luminous serpentine constellation Draco. As such, he became the good guardian of the star that controls the flow of existence from the transcendent sphere into the cosmos and back again. He opened the Draco portal establishing a flow of divinity into and out of the cosmos with every rotation of the celestial sphere. This is how they understood the Christian aphorism attributed to Jesus in the fourth gospel. 
I am the door, John 10, 7. So the North Pole is a portal where existence comes in and comes out. And God is there. I am the door. So you need to find the key. Yeah, that's all I got. And I think we should do this again. This was great. A lot of a lot of connections being made. And when I the entire week when I was getting ready for this, I was mentally taking notes. And I was connecting all these dots of where I wanted to start, where I wanted to go. And we went to Hollow Earth. We went to Santa Claus. We went to the North Pole. We connected John D. We connected all oh, mudras, everything into it. Naruto, they're doing all the mudras and stuff with their all this stuff. This was great, guys. You want to plug your stuff before you get out of here? We did two and a half hours of fire. It was fire. You want to go, Donut? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm also just thinking about Saturn. The northern part of Saturn is the hexagon. So, I mean, yeah. there's also that. But I'm Donut, D-O-E-N-U-T. You can find me on YouTube. And Mario? I am Mario from Symbolic Studies. You can find everything at SymbolicStudies.com or find me on YouTube at Symbolic Studies. I just want to say, Donut, this was a pleasure. Um, your last point, admittedly, my internet was tarting out a little bit, but uh, I think I got the general gist of things. And what you're saying about the psychological and the anatomical, 100%, uh, that can't be lost or forgotten uh, with all of this stuff. So I think that it's pretty much one and the same as above. So below macrocosm, microcosm, all this kind of stuff. One of the things that gets me really excited about Northern symbolism is that it feels like a return to self. Honestly, it's a return to your own sort of perspective and your own divinity and everything else. So I think that's kind of what it encourages as we're researching this sacred center in the heavens or on the plane, it actually gets you closer to your sacred center, which is why these deities uh, are associated with it. So just wanted to leave with that. Awesome. And I'm Juan from the Juan Juan podcast. I'm on any major podcast platform at the one on one podcast on all social media platforms. Thank you for being here with us tonight or wherever you are. And we'll catch you on the other side.